Shall we get started? Okay. <laughs> well, there will be. All right. Call to order the regular board meeting of the school board, March 13th, 2023. Citizens may comment on items appearing on the agenda when invited to participate during the agenda item by the board chair. Um, citizens may comment on items related to school district business, not appearing on the agenda of the comment portion of the meeting. Citizens, after identifying themselves, if you'll proceed to make comments as briefly as the subject. Basic rules of the primary to say at all times. The chairperson may interrupt or terminate the individual statements when appropriate, including when statements are out of order, too lengthy, brief personal argument, argue too much seen, irrelevant, or otherwise improper. The public should realize that this is a trustee business meeting conducted in a public forum. Okay, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the God of the United States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, all right, we'll have the consent agenda. We need to entertain a motion for the approval of that. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. To be seconded, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, approval of bills. So, so yeah, I just had a little question about the water bill from Teddy John's water store. Yes. Why all the you know the dinky little? So it's every time they deliver, they send us an invoice. Oh, so instead of sending they us, they fill it. Yeah. So it's um, in the elementary cafeteria because we don't have a water. Okay. Um, we don't have a sink in there at oh, the time. Yeah. So they just have a their tabletop where they put the gallons in for the kids to get fresh water. Okay. Yeah. So we get we get charged for whatever they put in to fill it. Up. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and then it's also um, the salt for the software as well. So it's oh. water and salt. Okay, yeah. I, it just looks, yeah, those were a little erratic. I just, yeah, it's just it. if they come once a week to mm -hmm. refill it, then we get a separate invoice for sure. each delivery. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <clears throat> Do you have to know how much the this propane has cost in this versus what it cost us last year? I know it's gone up a tremendous mm -hmm. amount. I don't, but I can get that for you for yeah, next it, one. It's yeah. not big. I just thought maybe it happened. Yeah, I can certainly run a comparison from last year to this year just to see. And I know it was extra cold this year. We had the leak uh, well, I, last month. That's right. Yeah. But I think that actual cost per gallon of it, how it probably is way increase, up. Yeah. <coughs> And the custodial supplies here for 2500 is that cleaning supplies? Yeah. So anything that the like the night cleaning crew use, it comes from that encompass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I got I just gotta ask about this one. What's the J Bull security? <coughs> 
you want to put the security <laughs> so it has to do with the code the multi-factor authentication that caps the computers so this is like a detriment to that right? oh yes okay. it so it has to do with your computer justin Correct. It's in order because that multi-step verification in order to log into your system instead of using my my personal phone for that. I'm using this. Oh, okay, okay. I just thought that you know they're set in the rest of missing out on her. <laughs> no, I mean you could do that no. as well. If you want but to we that. use the we we get the verification on our phone, yeah. and that's the difference. Okay. <coughs> I'll make a motion to approve the February bills. I will second that. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Correspondence? Yes, public participation. We've got one maybe. Ashley would like to speak, but uh, we'll, we'll, it is an agenda item. So. Uh, well, no, not specifically. It's not regarding the calendar you're going to approve tonight. Oh, is it different calendar? Yeah. Okay. Um, then this is the proper place. If it's not the calendar, we're going to discuss right now. Sure. So go ahead. All right. Um, so I just do I, do I come up here. Sure. Uh, well, the where does the owl uh, leave oh, there? there? Just um, some like information thank you. about looking at the possibility of a four-day school week versus five. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm here as a community member and parent to talk about it. So I know it's probably not something we can get in motion and get going for the next school year, but I think it's something possibly worth looking at, workshopping for future school years. Um, I think there's a lot of pros to it uh, for cutting costs. We're constantly talking about budget and there being no money and things like that. Um, I think it can really help with sub costs, teachers missing days, students missing days, appointments, uh, things like that, hourly employees, transportation, overhead costs, all that type of stuff, I think could help to reduce the budget and maybe give some better balance and also help with teacher retention. As we know, that's kind of looking bleak across the nation at the moment. Uh, and with enrollment to teacher college numbers, it's not gonna be getting any better. So. Uh, there's just what I provided was just some MTSBA article where they answered questions about how you go about doing that, getting parent and community uh, input, and then, of course, staff and things like that. And then just the article that the VP came out with where Fairmont Egan just went to a full day or four day school week. They're the third, I think, in the Flathead County, and there's 175 schools across Montana that are now doing that. And that kind of seems to be the trend with a lot of different places. So. If nothing else, I just kind of want to plant the seed for it. And maybe it's, I think it's something worth workshopping and getting community input on. Thank you. So, yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think you're right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, West Valley Gives No Report. It's done. <laughs> What's that? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Is that a vote? Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 oh. Um, that we have a report from the PTO. I keep seeing these things up on the marquee that we have fundraisers at these different restaurants, but we never have a report from the PTO. I'm wondering what the deal is, but. Okay, but nobody's going to speak up. Okay, well, no PTO report. How about the West Valley Teachers Organization? That's us again. Uh, well, <laughs> actually, <laughs> not just me. <laughs> All right, we brought some kiddos too that are going to share some 
stuff with you. More exciting than us. Um, while they're getting set, I'll just go over a couple of things. I Ashley to have to teach first grade. We all do. Lindsay Bird, Mandy Briney, and Ashley Thompson. Uh, so we just brought a couple of slides to show you for the kids start. This is kind of our not kind of this is our reading data from fall to winter. Um, and just looking at our different tiers here, how as a grade level we have kind of progressed. So huge shout out to the first grade team. Like we are seeing kind of them move through these tiers how we want, not too fast, not too slow. Uh, and just seeing that green on level group growing and kind of our intervention groups getting smaller. So um, we've been working really hard obviously with all these kids and then not possible without all of our paras who are pulling our small groups. And we have had some struggle with that losing a para. We had to lose a reading group. All the reading groups got bigger because of it. So not having that para support is difficult because we would not be seeing this kind of growth and improvement across our grade level without those intervention groups, which they provide, which is awesome. So, and then of course, Tanya for facilitating <laughs> all of the things for reading group and everything. So good job. That's a great job, actually. That's a big deal. <laughs> And some fun stuff. We went on a field trip to Glacier Park. So we have some kiddos that are going to share. Roger, you want to come on up? Share some things that we did. Come over here, Ross. Ross is going to share some writing that she did about the field trip. <laughs> Yesterday, we went on a field trip to Glacier National Park. We got to spend all morning snowshoeing. We learned about animals that hibernate, migrate, and resist. Did you know that a hummingbird migrates? It's true. I had a blast. It was so great. Beautiful, beautiful handwriting for a first grader. And I've got a couple too. Can we go first? In my opinion, my favorite field trip was Glacier National Park. I like the the predator play game. I like learning about what animals do when a predator comes to catch them. I liked when we had to freeze. Also, it also I like sledding, sliding down the hill. It felt like sledding, but without a sled. <laughs> now you know why you should go snowshoeing at Glacier National Park. Thank you. My opinion, Glacier National Park was the best field trip. I love throwing the pine trees. The mountains were breathtaking. Another reason is I like the good field. The river was beautiful. There was also a beaver <coughs> dam in the river. Snowshoeing was a really good way to get exercise and see the beauty. This is why Glacier National Park was the best field trip ever. <laughs> And we did um, a unit on penguins. And so I have a couple students that are gonna share some fun facts about penguins. My name is Molly. I'm going to read you a story about penguins. Some birds can fly, but penguins cannot. Penguins live where it's cold, but some live where it's hot. The little blue penguin is very small, but the emperor penguin is big and tall. I like penguins. You like them too? Let's go see them at the zoo. <laughs> My name is Julian. My favorite penguin is the Adelie. Adelie penguins live in Antarctica. Their eggs hatch in December. They like to hunt krill fish and squid. They have white <coughs> bellies and black backs. Their coloring helps camouflage them from predators in the water. Their bellies blend into the sky when 
predators was up. Their their back I mean, backs blend into the ocean when predators look down. My name is Katie. My favorite penguin is the king penguin. King penguins are the second largest kind of penguin. They are black with white bellies. They have orangish red cheeks and bill. They also have yellow on their neck. King penguins like to get around by sliding on their bellies across the ice. This is called toboggan. <laughs> This is Zara, and we're going to read this together. Penguins swim in icy water. It is important they stay warm. They spread a special oil over their feathers. The oil keeps them waterproof and warm. This is called cleaning. During art, we drew with crayons on paper. Then we painted the paper. The crayon made the paper waterproof. The crayon is like the oil penguins use to stay dry. So in first grade, we work on extending the um, number and counting sequence. And so we've been working really hard at writing our numbers the right way and writing above 100. So if you want to show how high you can count? All right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Thank you. 
Zoom in a little bit. What I did was uh, went back to our ASOP. And ASOP frontline is the system we use uh, when a teacher or a para is absent. They put their absence into ASOP. Uh, and then the system works to try to cover that absence. Uh, it keeps track over time of the amount of unfilled positions or absences and the amount of filled absences. So uh, it didn't take very long. But I went through each day since January 3rd, just because I thought I picked an arbitrary day there just to start. Um, and then just track only the unfilled absences. This does not include absences where no sub was needed or an absence where a sub was assigned to that position. Um, if you add up all of January um, in the instructional days, we had 51 absences unfilled. So that was an average of about 2.6 per day uh, that were not filled. And we had 20 school days that month. Um, <clears throat> if you go into February, it gets a little worse. We had a total of 99 absences that were not filled for an average of 5.2 daily. So that means you're walking in and you're down over five people just that day that were not covered. Uh, <clears throat> and then in March, it's already kicking off to be worse than February. So we haven't had very many instructional days yet, uh, but you can see we had nine on the third unfilled. We had six, seven, seven, five, eight. So we have a total of 5.9 absences um, unfilled on average so far in March. So the reason that I bring that up is because if we add it all up, into here we have a total of 203 absences for people that was, were unable to be filled. Um, that includes classroom teachers and parents. Um, we've had a total of 48 school days since January with an average of 4.2 per day. So the reason I bring that up is to show you how hard it's been uh, to staff that and to cover what we need to cover um, for uh, student monitoring wise. So Richard. what I did was I took a Paris schedule. Richard. I'll get to that top. Can I, can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah. Uh, can you scroll back up for, for sure. just a little bit? I want to ask a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. So these unfilled positions, mm -hmm. so let's say you have a classroom teacher who's absent. Mm -hmm. Pretty often, if you're able to, you pull a para to, to yeah. fill in, right? Right. So is that reflected here as so well? So that means the para is then unfilled as well. Okay. Because uh, what... what I don't want, or what I want to have is an accurate picture to show mm -hmm. That even if a position gets filled with a para, yeah. that doesn't mean that all positions were filled that day. Right. Um, we, we're still operating at a deficit mm -hmm. whenever it comes to staffing. Yeah. We mm -hmm. call that's our daily slide. That's what we call it because mm -hmm. it's so fun. <laughs> 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 it's actually just, because we're just taken from Robert Peter to pay Paul. Um, 
Yeah. But we have to have have to have to without a doubt cover recesses, lunches, just because of student safety. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so anyway, but going back down here, you know, and I'll get to that that part too. I took a pair of schedule Blair's, and I just cal calculated the duties here of where they're just watching kids or they're somewhere that where they have to be. And it totaled 125 minutes for 2.1 hours per day. That's uh, her schedule just happens to have morning recess. She's a kinder lunch, kinder recess, third grade, then fourth grade lunch, then afternoon recess. If we pull her, then we have to cover that. Um, then you look at the academic skills groups. She has 40 minutes of third grade reading, 40 minutes of kinder reading, 30 minutes of kinder math, 35 of fourth grade reading, and 30 minutes of fourth grade math. That's a lot that she does instructional wise. Okay, that comes out to about 175 minutes or 2.9 hours. So if we pull Blair to cover a classroom, that's almost three hours of instruction she is not able to provide if we cannot fill everything, which it, it's pretty impossible to fill every, everything in that day. So this then becomes the priority, right? This is the safety piece. So if you take the you know, number of times where they have to be pulled, you know, if we're talking about an average of 4.2, you know, that could be classroom, that could be paras. And I can tell you from experience, rough estimate, this is several hundred hours this year that we will lose in academic uh, instructional time from paras alone. And it also speaks to the inconsistency kids see um, in their day. If, you know, they come through and they don't know who their lunchroom person is going to be, expectations are different. Behaviors escalate, same outside. Behaviors escalate. Um, you're not seeing the same person. Sometimes it's one out there. Um, you just do your best. You can't see everything. Um, at one point, there's you know well over 100 plus kids out there at one time. Um, even one grade level, you know, like second grade or third grade, is approaching 100 if they're all here that day. So anyway, um, again the you know, math works out that we're on pace right here. If we look at ratios so far with 48 days, we've had 203 unfilled absences. Um, the rest of the year, we've got 57 more days. That means we're on pace for 444 absences that were unfilled. That's only since January. That does not include the beginning of the year. Um, Can I ask a question to me? When I was um, subbing here last year, um, I would have subbed every day. Like I asked, can I just be a permanent sub? Because they needed subs every single day. And, you know, of course, you know, I guess you, it has to go through the budget. Now I see. But is that a possibility where you just hire, I don't know, budget wise, I haven't looked at numbers or anything, but that you hire permanent subs. So you always have, you know, you always have somebody here to teach a class That's, and if you don't need a sub which you always do right. then they're available as paras or whatever i think that's something that we can consider as um, in the long term uh, the challenge that's one person mm -hmm. right um, and as yeah, you can see from but i don't know how many uh, a lot would of it be easier to find Sub can speak to, to a, little bit. a lot of people don't want to do that because mm -hmm. subs don't get benefits. Right. The other reason that they, they don't want to do that is because they don't want to work that much. Right. It's, it's very rare that you have a sub that wants to work every day of the week. So we have one sub that comes in and fills positions for us as a pair, but she only works a certain number of right. days. Of this. And then if she's gone that day, then, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're down, you know, even more. Right. Um, and that's kind of like up, up here, you know, we are at this moment as of today still down six paras from where we were at this time last year. In 21 22, SPED had a total of five paras, uh, Title had nine paras. And in 22 23, we have three in the SPED department with uh, the same number of life skills kids. And we have, we are down to five in Title. And that this would be an example of a, of a Title para who does, um, you know, monitoring students and uh, instruction. Uh, the life skills parents, like in the SPED, their whole day maybe with a kid that just is there for them. Yeah, you know. Uh, so but we, so the subs are working, you know, as hard as they can to fill those. But even right. today, for 
example, we had maybe four absent, which isn't a lot for the size of our staff, but I, I don't think we had a sub in the building. That was not a long-term sub. We had a long-term sub for Alicia Duquet and for Jessica Milky, and no sub in the building. But, so I don't know if it's just simply hiring, you know, a, a full-time sub or but if, ways. if someone wanted to work yeah. full-time, we have full-time positions available and we don't have yeah. applicants for those positions mm -hmm. that are open. Yeah, right um, now we have one still open. We were able to hire for our computer lab monitor who left us in December, Cheryl Weil. And, uh, but I mean, other than that, we, we used to have five, six pair of so five for a position that we are so lucky to get any really, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but I think that speaks to the toughness of the job. It's an incredibly hard job mm -hmm. and it's one of the most important mm -hmm. and it's paid, you know, not very well right. too. And so I mean, lots of challenges and I, I don't present solutions. <laughs> I just present the problem. I just wondered if it might have might be yeah. easier to hire somebody who wants yeah. to like I'm a retired teacher, so I want to, I don't want to stand on the playground all day, but I would teach any grade all day every day. Yeah. So I just didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be harder or easier to hire than a parent. Yeah. Um, I, so the last school that I worked at, we actually pursued that route um, mm -hmm. and hired, we hired a person who was specifically on staff to sub. Right. Um, she was a certified teacher. She moved to the area late. Um, military family. She didn't necessarily want to work full time, full time. Mm -hmm. um, and within a semester, she was done. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. because the kind of the wear and tear on a person of being yeah. in a different classroom every day. Yeah. Classroom yeah. management is already a struggle when you're a substitute. Um, the, the, she wasn't, I think, mentally prepared for what it takes to go into kindergarten this day and then sixth grade the next day and then third grade, you're there for maybe a couple of days. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she, I think, thought too, and this would happen here as well, that it would be like an occasional thing, right. but that she would be our first level go-to person, that she was guaranteed right. um, a sub position if we needed one. She wasn't expecting it to be every day, right. and it was every day. Right. So um, <laughs> I've seen it attempted, and it there were instances where we were really in a bind, and we would beg her, and she would come in mm -hmm. if we just really pleaded. But um, the other challenge was from a cultural standpoint, she never really felt like she belonged because she was a sub. Um, so in, in theory, I think it's a great idea. But like I said, and like Richard's pointed out, we, we have open positions right now for paras that we're not getting, we're not getting applicants for, we're not getting qualified applicants for. Um, and then our sub pool is yeah, because we tend shy. to hire our subs too. Right. You know, we, we say, "Hey, come to be a parent. You're here every, you know, mm -hmm. as much as you can." Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's a it's a really big challenge. I don't think it's only. Well, I know it's not just unique to West Valley. It's yeah. all over the state of Montana. It's all over everywhere, and it's uh, something that I think at a legislative level we'll have to look at if we want to, you know, continue to provide what we want to provide with these kids. And I don't know if it's a budgetary thing, if we do increase pay, something, I mean, something has to happen because this is not sustainable for our people. Richard, I don't mean to put you on the spot, yeah. but do you that. think, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, just get after Ashley's presentation, but four oh, day week, yeah. do, you, do you feel that a four day week would help this situation? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So that's an important you know, in our consideration. At yeah. this point. Not only does it in decrease the number of days you need somebody, but it also mental mental health wise, mm -hmm. I think uh, we you know tend to see a lot of burnout in this job anyway. You know, teachers classified. Uh, I just really feel like, and that's kind of a you know different river that we can boat down. But but I do feel like this um, is a clear picture of you know burnout. Richard, can I pick you up just a little bit off of what Cindy said too? Because right now we're doing that to our paras. So the exact yeah. situation that you described with that sub, 
I worry yeah. every day about their burnout because they come in and they don't know what they're going to do and every day is different and they're constantly in different classrooms. So I'm worried because we have a great para team, but yeah. it's really hard on them. Yeah, and I know I'm probably hard to be biased, but I, I feel I feel in my heart that we have the best staff in, in the valley, mm -hmm. um, especially classified. I mean, most people are unreal at what they're able to do, willing to do. And if we operated in a typical traditional staff, we, we would be sunk. You know, there would just be no way. Um, and another thing to think about too, you know, it just pulls every, it pulls everything, you know, um, even when we're normally staffed, this is an incredibly hard job. If everything is going really well, and we're all here every day, it's already that hard. And so this makes it just even, even harder. And, you know, they used to, I mean, honestly, I mean, I've said it before, but it's, uh, it's definitely something that recently since COVID, I think has been such a huge, issue and it was going that way too even before that yeah <laughs> so, uh, i just wanted to one question a comment a question one to speak to what richard is saying they part of that too is a para gets pulled from a classroom their groups get canceled and then all of a sudden those kids have to stay in your classroom where they're teaching reading intervention groups because these kids a lot of them can't read yet and i'm teaching an on or above level group i they can't access the curriculum i am you know giving to those kids and then in turn they just really have nothing to do but sit and read to themselves for 30 plus minutes so that's also very difficult also every time you look out the window richard or uh, tanya is out at recess every single recess and that is like completely absurd because we need support from we often need things from Tanya. We often, very often need things from Richard and you can't get any help because they're doing the job of a para outside at recess in the lunch every room. single recess or in the lunchroom. So it's like, just creates chaos all around. Uh, but then my other question is, uh, can we make this into some type of nice slide presentation to get out to parents yeah. so that they feel the weight of what is actually, what's actually going on? And I think that's a great idea, especially to help you know, with the potential for a general fund levy, you mm -hmm. know, yes. this, mm -hmm. this uh, summer, you know, these are the type yes. of things that we need to show yes. to and the community. And I think community start putting to, out before we start yeah. asking for money, like, hey, this is the reality, not because we want your money, but because this is the reality. And it, it's actually, yeah. I think we yeah. played on the community's heartstrings enough when they told us no, they're not. And I think it's time that they see the data. Yeah. 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 I haven't passed anything since 2007, and we can only, you know, the Oliver twist or whatever, you know, so much. <laughs> yeah. and they're still telling us not. So if they see this and they want their kids to have, you know, what they came here for, then it's, it's something's going to need to break. Are you just adding your report? Yeah. Cindy put on a dress, and I an idea she has for community involvement uh, before we have to ask for that money. This would be really important. Yeah, I, I just um, threw this together too. Like the format is terrible. So I <laughs> needed something that could give you that visual fast. <laughs> so, these just auto fill. So gorgeous. <laughs> well, I appreciate all of you. I know how hard it is. I appreciate all your work. Yeah, it's it's a great team. I mean, there's no way we can. And you know the yeah, it just goes all the way down the line. And everyone's willing to step up and do it. Anna will cancel something, you know, and then she'll have to cover lunch, and then that means two kids she didn't see, and then she'll go get those kids and not do something else, like take a lunch for herself. Do you feel like we could help this issue with an attempt at growing? A substitute list that would be more reliable, or do you feel like time is better spent hiring more pairs that we can move around and float from place to place? But I we think, all know yeah, that uh, that in and out of the para situation is not easy either. It's not, and I would say that a para uh, and a good quality para is worth their weight in gold because Absolutely. they can do groups, they can teach kids. That more pairs we have, the more groups we have, right? You know, we're, we're restricted budgetary reasons you know that we can't do that but
but if we had um, you know a sub list that was huge and reliable um, and a pair team that was expanded it's kind of high in the sky stuff so maybe a little bit of each one would be awesome does anybody know the, the budget cost wise between the two of them if we're hiring subs every single day and paying them x amount and right. versus what a pair would yeah and that's a good year. point too if you figure out the hourly wage of myself you know tanya alicia anna who never expensive. doesn't have a class that that mm -hmm. adds up a lot yep yeah, absolutely day. And if you're covering, you know, 30, 30 minutes is a very, very, sh uh, there's been two days, I think, since January 3rd that we haven't been out scrambling for that, you know, so that's, that's a lot, you know, it's a lot of money too that's being paid in that way. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, well, and then you're spending a lot of time focusing on something that doesn't uh, benefit. You know, right, that isn't what you right. should be focusing on, right? Yeah, well, because yeah. things get dropped too. Like, they need you yeah. during those hours because that's their time, right? Like, they have to come exactly. find you, exactly. So, and you know, it's already hard enough working. to talk to a teacher, you have to do it at the recess time, you yep. have to do it at their lunch, you have to do it at their specials, or if you're always full for that, then it just limits the amount of time I had face to face contact, even with the staff this year. I feel like there's been just a lot of missing, a lot of that missing. Uh, I try, you know, I try to say at least hello to every staff member every day and i have not been able to do that this year at all it failed a lot last year but that was something i really tried to do and what you're filling in are the safety positions yeah the that, yes ones we can't yep. not do without right the exactly playground lunchroom lunchroom yep and then we're trying our best to cover the academic groups i know we've, we've had alicia's covered them i think tanya covers them all the time we, mm -hmm. we have paras even that will teach in a class and then Try to cover their own groups too. Uh, Julia White's a sub or a pair, excuse me, the time so that leaves at 1:30 and she's offered to stay all day several times just to help cover that. Uh, if you've been in a bind, but so just to clarify back to the sub list, so you know, so you have the absence, you guys go down the whole sub list and yeah. just get turned down by everyone for that day. Yep, I mean, I think so. I, I, um, I, I can show you here really quickly. What, the, what it looks like. Frontline is very slow. It's, <laughs> it's incredibly slow. Um, even slower on your phone when you're trying to do it on the go and see where someone is. I think if we let a targeted effort at recruitment for subs, I think we could probably help. I think them. that's yeah. a pie in the sky idea. I'm sorry, but it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I think people who are willing to come in and sub, they are at a premium and, and to put base anything on the idea that we're going to that we're going to reinforce our sub list i think we need to look elsewhere because i doubt that we're going to ever really get a whole list of subs for either pairs or teachers well maybe if our parents see the numbers that we have times where you yeah, know, I think the it's ability to cover our kids. Something that parents don't know. Parents might yeah. step mm -hmm. up and maybe they have other family members that they can engage in the process as well. Yeah. And I just feel like we do it. I mean, I don't mean we as in West Valley School. I mean, our profession does a pretty bad job advocating for themselves because we just are kind of do it people. And, you know, we, we, that's just the way it is. And I think we need to start kind of being a squeaky wheel a little bit and say, we need help. You know, come on, guys. And once again, then when I think that we do, I, I subbed for a lot of years, 13 years at the Kelsco Junior High. And there were, I mean, there were times when I would, did not feel welcome, even though, I mean, I was saving somebody's, but, you know, <laughs> the rest of the teachers didn't acknowledge that. I'm just saying that we need to maybe be real careful that we engender a, a friendly environment for this. Yes. Yeah. So for our parents and, and our and our teachers because that's really important mm -hmm. yeah so here's an example of what it looks like so you log in here this is for march 13th 2013 we have a total of 10 people gone today three people that are gone with no sub needed um, that would be an example like a counselor or myself um, we just don't have kids sitting in front of us every day um, unfilled five and filled two you know, so you can see the five unfilled here. You know, you go to the ones that were filled, and I think those are the long-term subs. Yeah, mm -hmm. Jessica Milky, uh, that we should request, and they're here every day, essentially as admission subs. And you can go to tomorrow, and this is a daily thing where we figure out, okay, we're already nine down tomorrow. We're going to walk in 
it tomorrow with five unfilled, most likely. That's assuming if nobody calls out sick tonight or tomorrow morning, which happens a lot. Uh, and you know, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a daily daily game where we're you know texting with each other, trying to figure out what to do. Fifteenth is already eight. Beware the you know IV mark. Step <laughs> seven. So you can kind of see that it's just, I mean, that's where we are. That's our week right there. And then Friday's always the worst, and that's already at 10. And ASOP puts out to the people who are interested, but then Brooke makes phone calls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She yep. tries. And texts people. Don't fill, she tries to get yep. people. Say, please, we come in today. And so a lot of times we'll say, I can't get in until 11. I've got an appointment or mm -hmm. whatever. It's just, uh, it's just a constant, it's a constant game, a constant puzzle. Uh, but anyway, but, so, yeah. Thanks. That was refreshing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All well, I'd rather follow that than first graders. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Deer and Gil. They're the curriculum director right now. Um, um, I would just, I guess, to go off what Richard was saying about the subs and getting the word out there. Should I probably, is this going to be the best dongle for me to use, Kat? I can see both points and Justin, that's a big thing that I thought about with recruitment is um, even before COVID, but particularly since then, um, I, I've talked to people about subbing and they, they don't even realize that they're uh, qualified unless they have, they think they have to have a teaching degree. And so I think getting information out to help people understand that we can use them. I mean, we'll train them up the best we can. And I think that, um, you know, it might not get us completely full, like you said, um, but it would be helpful, I think, to get some more information out there about what it takes to be a sub. And we also used to have sub volunteer appreciation training I look at that you remember um so I was asked a few hours ago to come in and talk to you a little bit about our new math curriculum um and I wanted to give you some more information on um the data for our math I know um at the last board meeting Richard shared some um, great data on the pyramids and things for K-4, and then Tina verbally shared some for 5-8. Um, so um, actually, I'll put this, I'll pass this around when I get to it. Um, so I just wanted to talk about comparing our data and what our new math curriculum is looking like and how it's going, and teachers can chime in and um, we'll talk about that. So something to think about with an adoption year for any curriculum, um, change is really hard and it takes time. You're changing the entire way, everything from your teacher manual to your online platform, to what the students see, to the support, everything is different. Um, we actually don't expect to have huge gains right away. We're actually pretty happy with the gains that we're seeing. Um, and we don't know, I mean, it takes time to know what that comes from. We don't know that it's the new math <laughs> but we don't expect um, a lot of gains, but we keep a close eye on it. Um, it. Takes two to three years to discover the full capacity of a new curriculum. And so we're in the first year. Um, I was fortunate to 
teach this year. So I was in the classroom and I was able to use the math curriculum. So I've had my hands in it quite a bit. And, um, and so I've learned a lot about it. Um, we've had trainings. I've listed them all there so far. Um, we have another in-person full day training next Wednesday from the company. Um, and then the other thing that we have that I know the, the math team last year, the adoption team was really excited about was all the teacher support. And so there's a coaching studio at each grade level called a huddle. Um, to me, it's almost like a private Facebook page where you can post something that you did or a question and then they can talk to each other and the coach can come in and give them little tidbits and um, being new, um, you know, we're just learning about it. Some teachers have taken advantage and are getting in there and using it and some haven't yet. But like I said, we two to three years, hopefully, and everybody's kind of um, getting comfortable and jiving with it. Um, there's also a teacher's corner that is not um, like a real feedback type of thing, but it's a training modules and articles that teachers can go to. Um, on their own time. So there's like a model lesson. If they know they're going to teach something and they want to see a model lesson of that before they teach it, they can look at that. Um, they can learn about a new strategy, find out how, how to use or find a resource in the curriculum that they need, um, different things like that. So love the teacher support. Um, one thing that uh, into math, well, a big, big deal was a better online component than GoMath had. Um, and even though, because they're also a new curriculum, they're working out some kinks. Um, I know our, our eighth grade teacher, she gave me a list of some feedback and she said um, originally earlier this year, she couldn't see much specific student feedback or you know their um, data without clicking through every single assignment and now, they've kind of fixed that. And so she just goes in and asks the question and then they've been very, very helpful to her to get what she needs from that. Um, the teachers have little um, games in every unit that they can play or have the kids play in downtime or early finishers type things. There are STEM projects in every unit. So um, some of these things, honestly, I don't know that many teachers have had a chance to get to. Because honestly, like with every curriculum, they put way more in it than you could possibly do. <laughs> and that's because, you know, it's better to have too much and pick and choose what you'd like to use than, you know, to not have enough and be scrambled. Um, you have professional learning cards for the teachers to talk about different discussions and, um, being a new curriculum, it's really focused on, you know, the math discussions and problem solving and collaborating and different things like that. Um, although I know that uh, the three reads was already a strategy our staff was using, um, but for new teachers that come on board, which is a big deal, um, you know, they have resources to help them with those things. Um, did you guys want to say anything? Yeah. Oh, I brought stuff. Oh, did you? Are we? Oh, is this our? Can we share? Like, come up now? We, or? We oh, sure. Elementary. Well, yeah. And then I can <laughs> talk about the data later. Or what? It doesn't matter. Mean, I can just. You know what? I'm almost done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So from fall to winter benchmarks, I just quickly looked through STAR, which is just third through eighth grade. Um. And I'm gonna give you these now. So if you can take one and pass it along. Um, I gave you a growth graph for each grade level, grade three to eight. Um, so you see the two, the two little dots. The first dot is just the average for the grade level, the average percentile and standard score. Um, and then the second dot in late January, early February is the 
set uh, the winter benchmark. So as you can see, if you look to the right, you see the 75th percentile, 50th percentile, and 25th percentile. And obviously that grows, meaning as their scale score grows, their percentile, if they just stay the same percentile, they're growing, if that makes sense. <laughs> so um, it's really neat to look at this over time. This doesn't tell you how many kids are proficient. This just tells you the average score, right? To show you the growth. Um, and then we'll be able to print a new one of these out at the end of the year. Um, and so you can see um, each grade level, um, is holding pretty well or growing pretty well. Um, eighth grade looks like about 51st to 49th. Um, and then always also considering that, um, I guess you guys can see, so there's the fifth, sixth, and we show them. So uh, no, did everybody get one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And so I also just, I looked a little deeper into a different form that's not as easy to print because it has all the students' names and things, but um, it just shows you from fall to winter um, how many points um, standard score the average growth was and then the percentile rank growth. And like I said, any percentile rank growth is great, is, great, is above average growth. <coughs> um, and you can say, you can see as they grow, it takes a little uh, less and less growth to reach those percent because, you know, the, the biggest growth is in those younger years. So, um, any question about those? It's just more of a visual. It doesn't give you specific numbers, but just to see the growth. Um, all right, so we'll hear some more information about um, the curriculum um, as we discover this and we'll be getting back together as a math team this spring talking about pros and cons of this new curriculum um, what we can do to make a plan for the next year um, implementation um, we continue to if we find a need or are struggling finding something we first look at the new curriculum that was bought and then we can look for supplemental curriculum outside um, we also want to walk this a little slowly and make sure that we're all aligned. Like if you see the grade levels come up and they're doing the same thing, and we want that to be, you know, true as we align it vertically and horizontally, that we're um, we're in line with what supplements we're using. Um, and then, even though this is star and it's one data point. We always look at several things, and we've been talking about this in the school improvement plan. You know, we have STAR, AIMS, Web, SBAC data, but we also have classroom data, and we have progress monitoring, and lots of different things that we look at. But I just give you um, one piece for now. Um, we also try to um, compare the same group of kids over time, rather a grade level against another grade level because you have those different groups of kids. I think I heard third grade is a particular grade with a large group of special education students. Is that true? Yeah. Third grade is also the group that was in kindergarten when COVID happened. And um, you know, so we are not only trying to teach a new curriculum that's to their grade level standards, we're also trying to fill and you know, keep pushing them forward. Any questions? Good. I'm done. You guys get to go. I'm back. It's me. <laughs> hey um, I'll just keep it brief since you know he wants to go. But I thought I would just Terry kind of presented some of the perks maybe, and I'm gonna pres present a couple of challenges with the curriculum. Um, so this is a first grade lesson that we just recently did. And for reference, our standard is 1.mbt.3, which is compared to two digit, two, two digit numbers based on the meaning of the tens and ones digit, and then record the results 
of comparisons with the greater than equal to or less than symbol. So those are, that's what the standard says we're working on, comparing the numbers to, and using those symbols, which would be questions four through 12, is like really what we want them to do in first grade. So the pages that I copied you, they're, let's see, at the end we have 24 questions, and this is on your own section. And this is not a realistic on your and, own. And they're first graders. Or six yeah. or seven year olds, not by a long shot. I have one kid who is working at a third grade level, um, and he cannot do this because he cannot read. He's in a reading mastery group, but he works really high in math. He cannot do this because he can't read it. So that's a barrier with a lot of math programs. Our old math was that way too. There was just lots of reading with it. And that was something we wanted to really look for, but probably hard to come by at this point. Um, but if you just like look at number two, that the critical thinking and reasoning needed to complete that problem is so far, like I have to read it a couple of times. And I'm like, wait, wait. So they vote at school for a president. Kim gets 52 votes. Jamie gets 32. Ed gets more votes than Jamie, but fewer than Kim. How many votes does Ed get? They're like, I do not care. <laughs> Mind you, the standard is we are comparing numbers using greater than, less than, or equal to symbols. That's not what we're doing here. And I'm all for like a couple, you know, in-depth questions, but 24 questions on and on your own. For a six-year-old, like it's too, it's too much. And a lot of our well, lessons are like question, this. They flipped, like it, it, they're not an, an order either. No. They actually flipped 29 and 32, but the other ones are. And so kids might just assume they're in order oh, yeah. and pick one. And, oh, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'm like, okay, let's write Kim under 52 <laughs> so we can hold a place for Kim. And they can't even write that small to yeah. even, I'm like, let's hold it, write Jamie under this number. Now we have to get rid of these numbers. Get rid. It's just, it's too much. Not a single one of my kids and across the first grade, group could do this at all. So that's a, that's one of our biggest struggles is they cannot do the on your own typically ever mm -hmm. on their own. So we're constantly, we do a whole group every single day, every single lesson. So it's really difficult for them to show the on your own because it's just too, it's too hard. Right. And so it's about the, what the standard is. Like if we're teaching common core standards, that's a common core standard. All we need is four through 12 to be firm and accurate. But if we're teaching it with fidelity and actually doing it the way it's supposed to be done, it's just not a possibility. Um, so that's just some of the challenges that we're, one of the challenges we're having with it. Um, the other thing- Just a sec on that. With some yeah. of the, uh, cause we just looked at the scoring, right? So, yeah. you know, you're kind of, I guess it doesn't have, this doesn't have first grade. Does it? No, I think it's third and that. Oh. Yeah. So if not a single student can get, He's correct. Does it does that then lead to kind of benchmark scoring, well, or are you saying the benchmarks only based on down here and there's just um, there's just like far too advanced? Yeah. So when work. we we Ames web test yeah. the kids and an Ames web test is like quarter twenty five percent of the dip level difficulty as this. So this is just like above 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 and beyond in my opinion. If Tanya would agree with that, yeah. The Ames web is pretty. It's like I'm not gonna say easy. The Ames Web is uh, age appropriate <laughs> and grade level appropriate, where this this is not. So what we're using for testing and benchmark testing and data is not not really really related to this at all. So that's also tricky. But we want to make sure we're providing them what they need to go on to the next grade level, mm -hmm. which also then it makes it that much more complicated. Because they really have to grasp this. No. So then they go to the next grade and it gets a little bit and it gets a little harder. Yeah. And then and then yeah. they, and then they're really in, in a stew. Yes. Yeah. So, so since it's a new program, does the uh, like does your does your feedback to um this program like do they do they adjust these you know kind of materials to kind of try to well, dial in so what's really so I think the curriculum is what some. Yeah, so we one frustration we've had in second grade is um, our common core standard is add and subtract fluently within 20. Um, and so that is, yes, you can use strategy skills, but that you fluently know those numbers forwards, backwards. Um, and that's pretty weak in this curriculum. And so we have asked and 
gone to the coaches corners and all the things and they provide us with supplemental online resources and we've been told not to supplement because we just purchased this curriculum but everything they've sent us is to a different website or try this or do this or that kind of thing and so our hands are tied to an extent because we've been told not to supplement so we're not meeting the standard the way we should be unless we supplement but then we can't supplement so it's like this roundabout thing of <laughs> not doing what we know is right for the kids um, and so that's been a big frustration I know for our team and across at least K4 in talking to teachers is that when going to the curriculum and pursuing the avenues they send you to another website online with games or something like that um, and I will yes. say in first grade also we that was my other thing I was going to say is there is no fluency mm -hmm. built into this program at all we've not run across it at all I've asked at several trainings mm -hmm. and first and fourth grade got waggle to use as an online platform um, and at the waggle training I said is there fluency in waggle and they said no there's not they're just supposed to be getting fluency by working through these problems but that's not reality so we and we have been so restricted on tech this year which I think is a huge problem that we need to address yes and we can we aren't providing these kids what they need and you can't say do flashcards because they're six and they're seven and they can't self-correct and I can't do flashcards with 18 19 20 kids by myself to correct them it's not realistic there's better mouse traps out there but we've just been restricted from using anything so what it comes down to is the kids just aren't getting what they need so I, as a teacher you have to decide okay do I do it anyways even though I've been told not to because I know what the kids need and I know what the common core standards are and what I need to teach mm -hmm. <laughs> so I close my door and do it yeah. but then they're like oh these scores are great we told you there was enough fluency in here like well okay no there's not yeah. <laughs> so these kids are going to second grade from first and we've already talked to second grade and like sorry so first, there's no fluency in first the question I have having not been here last year what was the review process because it seems to me that if this curriculum is so inadequate, mm -hmm. why wasn't that identified before it was adopted and purchased? So the review process was, and I was one of many on the team, but we went, we were given three uh, programs we could review. And we went through and one was Zern and that was all online. You could print the worksheets. That was kind of right away. We said that didn't meet the needs of what we needed for school. So then we were left with two others. And essentially, we were not given an option to like not adopt. We had to adopt because GoMath was going out. As a person on the team, and others can speak to this, it wasn't maybe like, yes, this is going to be the best thing for us. It was, you have to adopt. What are you going to choose? And it was picking what was going to be the best fit based on that. So we're doing the best we can. What was the other? So Zara um, and what was the third option? Uh, what was that? It was... It wasn't for it was envision. 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 envision that was the third one envision yeah, yeah. Okay. So, there are other math right and we had brought those to the table but based on what we were given as a committee it was those three we could choose from and so we went through those three and we filled out the rubrics and based on the rubrics and the discussion we had that was the best of the three um but it does have holes every curriculum is going to have holes. Sure, yeah. it doesn't matter which one you adopt right. nothing is perfect and we understand that. But I think the frustration this year has been, we are identifying a hole, this is a hole. And the tool we've been given to fix or do the hole is no fidelity to the program or do flashcards. You can't, you know, that's not gonna answer my, you know, concerns for fluency. I'm doing the flashcards, I'm playing the dice games. I'm doing everything I can to get these kids where they are. And it's not being reflected the way we would like to see. So um, we've seen going back even years. further than how the three that were presented to you as a committee, mm -hmm. how how were those three identified? Because there's I I don't know. I was given I three. Really I I wasn't a part of choosing those three. As a committee, I was given three to choose from. Just there were oh, um I have here looking at my computer. So there were, there was one that was K-5 only, two that were K-8, <clears throat> um, and 
three that were middle school only because there was a debate about if we wanted to have a different curriculum in the middle school versus the elementary or if we wanted a full k-8 um they were they were chosen by ed reports locally used and the curriculum um you know just calling around and talking to our co-op what's used mm -hmm. um they were you know you don't, i mean you want to review enough but you don't want to review too many either so i mean we we did know right away that zern wasn't a way to go so we dropped i don't know why certain are on the table it's, it was actually very high on head reports but it wasn't going to meet our needs well they have yeah i mean they have their supplemental part for the practice but they also have now a printed curriculum mm -hmm. so and we, we did go to whitefish because whitefish has into math and we were able to watch and discuss with those teachers that use it hands down probably the most powerful part of the uh, adoption was visiting with them and they shared those concerns and we shared those concerns and they were relayed um and it was what i mean the scores came down to was into math was the highest graded based on what we had so did uh, those teachers indicate that they were happy to supplement at a high level 100 percent, yeah and they showed us their supplementations and that was relayed i we brought that back that they were also supplementing and that it was not independent now i it was in mull down and it was a 90 minute lesson i just personally watched those kids sat in their desk for 90 minutes and did not move they were in their desk for 90 minutes that clientele did fine and they handled that we're not sitting in our desks for 90 minutes. i can't sit i mean i know that about myself uh more than <laughs> second grade it was 90 minutes 90 plus minutes. And they just sat in their desk the entire time and worked through page by page. Um, so, and our adoption agreement with them is it five or six years? Six, six years. So there was no other adoption period option. Was it six years or? Both well, um, envision and into mouth were the same. I don't want to admit this because. <laughs> we're the ones that close our doors in fourth grade, but our percentile rank is plus 11 and we use extra math for fluency and lots of super teacher repetition worksheets. Because Do you feel, because um, I taught Go Math when I taught fifth grade and I had to do the same thing. It was yes. just exactly like this. Did mm -hmm. you have to supplement as much with Go Math that yes. you just were allowed yeah. to? Correct. Yes. 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 Why aren't, why we, aren't we allowed to supplement? Thing. Um, mm -hmm. We were told we couldn't use reflex this year. It came down to a cost. Reflex costs money. Um, I think it's a very valuable program. And again, that's an, another discussion for another day. We were told to avoid tech and not get, you know, as tech heavy. And so to limit tech use. Um, so that cut a lot of our supplementation. And then extra math is free. Um, and we had started using that, but it didn't, the free version didn't meet the criteria for the kids security, security and ours was paid that. for through because yeah. we had already paid for it late last year so it was paid for and then we re-upped it and paid for it out of our own classroom funds oh okay. and two worlds kind of collided at the beginning of this year because we had virtually no restraints on technology okay. at all and after covid technology was coming in like crazy and so the this new math and technology kind of collided because we had to get a rain on what was happening in each classroom. So it's kind of like the perfect storm. Like we, nobody, anything until we know, you know, what everyone has. So I will say that kind of has let, you know, lent to this issue. We've swung like completely the other way where mm -hmm. we can't use anything at all, except for Waggle. I mean, and first grade has had nothing but problems with Waggle and <coughs> that, you know, first grade that, we really should probably get a refund for it. It's been horrible. I mean, I will email Tanya probably at least three to four times, usually a day. And she came in today because it's so it's been so bad of kids who have problems on Waggle and they're like getting all these error messages. And we were posting in the coaching studio and they're like, oh, try to clear the cache or whatever it's called. Try to, it, it's just not very helpful information that their feedback that they're providing and solving any problems. So, so they're like, oh, we reset that student. Nope, he had the same problem mm -hmm. again today. Mm -hmm. And so he can't do waggle. 
but she's unable to do anything else because we can't use anything else. You know, we could, there's another program we have to use. I could say, okay, hop on extra map, hop on, you know, whatever to be able to get that map work because Waggle also does not have fluency in it. So, so Waggle was purchased for first and fourth grade to see if that would be some, because it's very expensive to see if we could use that in all the grade levels, if it was, and, and we're glad we purchased it first and forth because they're having a lot of issues with kinks in the programs. And I was gonna bring my um, chat to show you because I go on the coaching suite quite a lot and I just have, you know, message to them after message, this isn't working, this isn't. And, and they do to their credit, they are working on it and they turn things around and okay, now that'll work. But then the next day there's something else. It's just, it's been pretty constant. I don't, I think fourth grade has had some success with Waggle, but partly because the kids are older, so they can navigate through some of the troubleshooting. My kids fix it themselves, and yeah. like, mm -hmm. I don't know how to fix it. Yeah. So I just push these buttons and it. So I don't know if, I don't, do we have to have Waggle for six years? I'm not sure about that. Or can we drop it out? But Waggle is nice in fourth grade, at least I think, for my high level kids, because it puts them at their level, um, so they're not held back. But, but it does it's not very independent at that level so it doesn't give them a thorough explanation of i, I don't you know yeah like multiplying I fractions them teach them how yeah. to do it before they can do it on their own yeah. mm -hmm. so jeff to also answer your question at the beginning of the year there's already a lot of requests to do a lot of supplementing mm -hmm. before the curriculum was even really implemented in the classroom and before we or the teachers had collected any real data. So I had made a directive, I guess you could say, to limit supplementing because my concern was that without even trying the curriculum, that what would start out as a supplement would become a supplanting situation. So to supplement something, you realize, oh, there's, there's this one deficit with the curriculum doesn't meet the needs of fluency, so we're going to bring in a fluency tool. So planting is we don't like the way it addresses whatever, or we have another way of wanting to do it, so we just teach it another way, the go in the room and close the door mentality and do it the way we want, which that's, if, if it gives us the result, which is student achievement, that's fine, but to have made the, the financial investment um, or continuing with a training investment. Um, we, and that's why I've asked for feedback at the meeting tonight is we need to know what, how effective is the curriculum? And if we start off with supplanting and supplementing, you don't get an accurate um, experience with the actual curriculum itself. And that's why I've asked the question about where, where was the review process? Because I know there are other math curriculums. I know that any curriculum, it doesn't matter if it's math or science or ELA, there's always going to be gaps that you have to fill. Mm -hmm. But from what I'm hearing from the practitioners of this curriculum is there are more, there are more gaps and there are more inadequacies than there are effective pieces. Um, which should have been, if it's if, if the curriculum is that ineffective, why wasn't that identified before the, the PO or the purchase was requested? Um, so we're, we're in a boat, we bought the boat, it's not a very good one. Um, so the, the question of, and Tanya and I had a conversation uh, last week about what are some of the challenges and what are some of the ways that we can overcome those challenges. And we're to the point now where teachers have had the, the fidelity experience with the curriculum that we do want to start looking from not just a piece by piece, everyone goes in the room and closes the door and does their own thing, but what is most effective in general in, in bringing in supplementary materials. So, the, the feedback that you're getting from the teachers that they've been limited on technology and that they've been limited on supplementing, that, that part is absolutely true because when we get to this point, they need to be able to give you 
and us, everyone, an accurate representation of the good, the bad, and the ugly of what this curriculum does. Um, if we see, and we've discussed this before, if we see a, a dip in test scores, that's to be expected anytime you implement a new curriculum. Uh, no one is going to be chastised or get in a hard time because their scores aren't what they usually are. We, need, we just, we need an accurate representation of what, what this curriculum does for us. I am not beyond calling the people at into map and saying, you sold us a false bill of goods. Mm -hmm. And well, I agree. I think we should express our the but we have to have an accurate <laughs> representation of this is why this is inadequate. Yeah. This yeah. is why you're not meeting the the agreement that we had with you as a purchaser. Um, I've gotten feedback from teachers that the training is not very effective. That even the trainers have come in and said, "Oh, just figure it out and supplement." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that because our check cleared? <laughs> you feel comfortable <laughs> telling us that now? Um, yeah. And the waggle piece, the challenges with it, with the technology, that is impacting probably our, our media students because it's the intervention component. So those students do not have an intervention piece. Um, and then just, just the level of tech support that has been available. And I asked the question because I know Kat's working very hard on maintaining adequate technology for us. Where's the problem? Is it is it something that we're not doing? Do we need to address it in house, or is it something that's on their server that's on their end? Um, and consistently, the answer is it's on their end. So um, that's the administrative context to the directive that's been given to the the teachers. Um, because if they ask us, well, what does your benchmark data say? Well, our benchmark data says our kids are doing pretty well, but it's because our teachers aren't using your program. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I have a few thoughts. Like, one, obviously, they're going to sell you on something and just show you the good things, right, and kind of hide the things that they know are already um, a struggle. How responsive do, you, do we know that they are about hearing feedback and making changes over time? Like, if, if they come back next year with a revised program that's actually improved some of these things and that feels a little bit better but if they're going to do nothing but give us the same thing for six years it's that's yeah i i do think they're fairly responsive the problem with that is that it's so much work to get like for instance there was a video that needed to be uploaded the video the waggle was not responding the way it should so the teacher tried to upload the video well their upload of the video, they had kinks in their system, it wouldn't upload. So I had to take it to Kat and she had to do all her technological magic on it. And then the video would upload and then I got it to Waggle and then they started working on it. And then the teacher, I said, well, what about the fact that I, we can't upload the videos because this is how you're telling us to get you what's wrong so you can fix it. And she said, oh yeah, I can't get my video to upload either. So I, I just put it here instead. So it's not that they're not responsive. There's a lot of errors in the program, just flat out the math is wrong yeah. on a, an anchor yeah. chart or the yeah. math is wrong on a worksheet. And so we're supposed to take pictures yeah. and send that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. We're well, supposed to that, take pictures like, and send that. And <laughs> it's a matter of questions. And I've read a bunch of the questions of my kids when they bring home homework too. And it's like, like, I'm not a math teacher. I'm not a math PhD either, but this needs to be written mm -hmm. better, like easier yeah. to actually see what the problem you're supposed to pull out of it looks like. Um, and so even the, at the eighth grade level with my eighth grader, I've been like, well, why didn't they just say this, right? Like, yeah. I'm interpreting it that way for you, and here you go. And he's like, oh, that's easy now. Yeah. But like, so they're responsive, so but it's a lot of work to get to the point where they're able, you know what I mean? It's yeah. a lot of work for the teachers. And we are trying, and I've asked teachers maybe to send more to me. And I'll send it to them because I, you know, can take that time out of my day. Yeah. But it's just a lot of work to get to that response. You know, I remember when we were discussing this back when we gave them the money for this huge program, a tremendous amount of money that's just making me very angry right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the big things was, you know, going back to what you're saying is that we were coming off the COVID thing. And we wanted to get the kids off the technology and parents were screaming that they didn't have worksheets they had were expected to work on the computer and they didn't like that and one of the big calling cards the big pluses for 
this program was they had an extensive workbook that we that was going to be included you know i mean maybe we maybe we overlooked a lot of the other things because they had the paper that everybody was calling for and that was included in the program at that time i mean i'm just to our yeah, to our credit that, yeah. i mean looking back now that was short-sighted but that was what we were looking at is some paper because that's what the, everybody was craving at that point in time then you look at this paper and think I mean, shoot for second graders. First, 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 first graders. First graders. First graders. Yeah. I couldn't even understand. Oh, anyway, um, we I mean, talked I a lot have... about the ease of um, the ease of utilization of the program to different students in your classroom. We talked a little bit about that and how this program actually offered a lot of those things. Is that after the fact now? Is it true or not? Um, they, at least from what I've seen, they've offered kind of like Go Math had some of it too. They have a reteach worksheet and an enrichment worksheet um, or a practice page. But at least in second grade, seeing at first grade that they even have those practice problems at the bottom without words is like, wow, that's awesome. Because yeah. by the time they get to second grade, we don't, we maybe get two, three problems of just the problems. The rest is completely words. You have to read oh. through it. And then off to the side, do the problem. Yeah. So even the enrichment pages or that's practice read to, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Um, is not a lot of like when you just did two-digit addition and subtraction and in Go Math you would have three lessons of nothing but practice, three mm -hmm. lessons, right? Mm -hmm. And we, this we didn't even get that. It yeah. was maybe three problems and then word problems. Right? Oh. We would then have to pull out the numbers and then again off to the side. So you lost everybody. Yeah. Well, it's the same way in kindergarten. It's kindergarten. And it's so there's again zero on your own because they can't read those sentences. No. So everything has to be read to them. Yeah. Um, kindergarten standard is fluently adding and subtract within five. And so um, it's report card time. And so I gave them a sheet and they can do the problems all sorts of directions if I'm reading it to them. But when I give them the sheet with just an equation on it, they've never seen an equation. They've never even seen two plus three equals blank because it's all just words and filling circles and lines. So, <coughs> so you go back to the old days where you find that. So we, we, I haven't, right. well, we're and, sticking to and I think we all are. Fidelity. I think yeah. in fourth grade too, we're we're still doing every we're doing the lessons. Yeah. We go through the book, we do the mm -hmm. lesson together, or break up into however everybody does it, and then we do we have been supplementing, but we are using the curriculum every day, and we aren't going through the, yeah. the lesson. Yeah. We yeah. still teach lessons. So, so you're giving it in, in that. Yeah. that. So you're giving it a chance. In yes. that way. Yeah. yeah, they're not just a bad idea. Oh, no, we've no. taught it every day. Yeah, but we just like they teach long division one day. Well, then we're going to practice the next three days with worksheets of long division because yeah. one day they're not going to learn long division. Two, two problems. That was literally a one day lesson. One day at the end of the module, and then the next day was test. Yeah. Standard well, algorithm yeah. of yeah. long division. Yeah, plus two other standards. Yeah. Oh. I do like the critical thinking aspect. Yes. I've, I've taught um, subbed in third and fourth grade, and I really do think that it makes them think critically in different ways. And I mean, that's a big plus for the program, I think. It but does. The, but, the little, but the kids that are struggling, that's that's beyond their. Yeah, they don't have those kinds of capabilities. Right. Well, yeah. And it's right. hard too, because you teach them like keywords, you know, you see more. Most of the time <laughs> in the second grade problem, if you see more, you're going to ask. Yeah. In these, it's more half the time is like more than so and so, but then you have to subtract to figure out really how much so and so has. So more, you got to keep reading on. So we used to just more box words. more and know, okay, more is our key word. You know, we're gonna now we have to box more than da, 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 da. what does that sentence mean? Okay, that sentence means this. So we're gonna go back now and we can perform right. the operation. Well, and then the, just these examples, there's more and less and or more and fewer or more and greater <laughs> yeah, or yeah. less and greater all They're in really the same the problem. Yeah. You can't just pick yeah. out your keyword and go yeah. on either. No. Yeah. 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 I'll be interested over time too to see how this scaffolds from grade level to grade level and what mm -hmm. that looks like because we've encountered a few issues in that way. Like first grade 
one of our first lessons was doubles plus one and doubles minus one. And I'm like, well, we haven't taught doubles, which in Go Math, we taught doubles, like a whole chapter of doubles. And then we did doubles plus one, doubles minus one. And that's big for them to have in second grade strategy to fluently, you know, be able to do some things. Um, so I'm like, they must have taught it. This program must have doubles in kindergarten. And so I combed through those kindergarten books and they never mentioned doubles a single time in kindergarten. And in first grade, they start as doubles plus one, doubles minus one. And our kids are like, oh, we don't know what doubles are. <laughs> and I'm like, oh gosh. <laughs> so they just don't know. Like it's really hard for them to conceptualize that when we haven't taught that, that base. So I'm curious, <laughs> you know, how, yeah. what other, what other standards and that we'll see that with. Well, the good news is we're all really excellent teachers. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's serious. Because we stuck to this this year, but we all know what we need to do and what we're going to do. And we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot of money. We're going to make it work for mm -hmm. sure. But it would be nice if we could get some money back for yeah. the yeah. things that absolutely don't work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, I was going to ask you about that. You know, I, I don't know. Do I remember 23000 Justin, that we gave for this program? It seems mm -hmm. that that speaks in my mind. Wasn't it 200? I was like, no, it's the ones of thousands, if I remember right. It was okay, more yeah, of a 200,000. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and, and it was not yeah. significantly different than what we were paying for before, right. but it, no. it was a lot more. Yeah. It was. And, uh, did we have to come up with that up front? I guess because we had all this extra money. If I remember questioning that, no, no problem. We got extra money coming out of our ears. And so, um, did we pay them the full amount? And now is that for yes. six years then? Yes. Well, but don't we have to? pay every year for new paper materials. No, no. We don't have to buy student workbooks every year. Okay. I thought it was everything, but no, so okay. it's like two hundred thousand for six years. I don't think it's two hundred thousand. Yeah. It, yeah. it was more than that. Yeah. It was two hundred thousand. It was like one six for everything. All six yeah. years. I think Waggle came in the program. <laughs> Joe, whatever. Was it was it was it was yeah. Three sixty. Was it three sixty? I think we should. I think we have that. I think we should try to get our money either back on Wangle or stop the subscription yeah. if it's a six year subscription. I don't think it's worth it. I do have some pros to yes. end on if we want to end on that note. <laughs> they better be really good. <laughs> Let me see how I can spin them. Um, some things that second grade does really like about int math is with go math, you know, it was separated by chapters. And so it, within a chapter, there was maybe 12 lessons, some took two days, review, test, intro day. You're looking at a month before you're doing the formative assessment. Now, I mean, not for cumulative assessment, all the things. We're doing it throughout the day. We know where the kids are. One nice thing with into math is the, uh, they do modules, not chapters, and the modules are shorter. So we are checking in with students much more frequently. Yes, that means more testing, but the Go Math tests were six pages sometimes, six yeah. to eight pages. I mean, it was like flipping through a book, whereas this is maybe six problems. A lot of them are multiple choice. Mm -hmm. So that's been good for us to get that, you know, data right there and then instead of just seeing on a whiteboard or a worksheet that they've done with us, we have that. Um, and so we've appreciated that within Int Math. Um, another just pro, just for fun pro. Um, with Go Math, you get a big, thick book. And for K-1-2 to hand them this big, thick book, and then you spend half the lesson, nope, it's page 35, 35. So every year before school started, teachers, we would sit and rip out every lesson, staple, tear, staple hours. I got staple shoulder, all the things. <laughs> this, I don't have to do that anymore because I have a little module. It's maybe three total. We can easily find the page number and move on. So another yeah. great pro. Um, I could keep digging if you really want <laughs> some more pros to end on, but just the positive note, the modules are nice. I mean, the shorter modules. You did mention multiple choice, but they're the crappy ones that are like, there could be possibly more than one. Well, and some of them are more than one. You don't know if it's two oh. or three or one, but we're getting there. The state <laughs> assessment is like that, and that has been that has been a progression that has happened across the board as a result of the the common core assessment have they it's one of the things that they brought in is um there may be more than one answer i mean that's that's been a frustration from the beginning 
and um, curriculums are introducing that concept because you don't want a kid to sit down to a test yeah and that's the first time they see it um and and honestly i mean that's the answer in life sometimes the, there are more than one answer um so it's it's not fun so I guess just as kind of a follow up from our perspective, are we at the point where we <clears throat> we consider, you know, providing some sort of supplementation program that works for everybody? So my, do, my thinking, still guiding this? just based off the conversation that I had last week with Tanya, is, you know, we're, we're coming in to having had a full year of experience with the, the current curriculum. The teachers are learning the good, the bad, the ugly about it. And then we look at having a, a committee for maybe after spring break to be more intentional about identifying what are the actual deficits in the curriculum and then identify a single intervention source. Mm -hmm. What I would prefer to avoid whenever it comes to the technology is, okay, so we have our curriculum model on. And then we have this intervention that is for this, and then we have this intervention that is for that. <coughs> there are intervention programs that are pretty comprehensive. I would rather we evaluate and identify the most comprehensive intervention program we can have. Um, and then we look into that for, for next year. Um, I, I'm just, I've seen it with my own child when she came home from kindergarten. And she had five different username and passwords because they were using five different online programs with kindergartners. Um, and I think so there's the, the user impact aspect of multiple programs. There's also the fidelity and data. It's okay. So which one of these three things actually worked? Um, but being thoughtful about identifying an appropriate and comprehensive intervention program and that ideally one that would have the enrichment component as well so that it covers an entire spectrum of students who are struggling have access to things that are on their level but students that are advanced also have things that are going to push them and challenge them that is um, just kind of the above and beyond in order to make that educated decision we need to know what are the failures of it now which the teachers are gathering and they will know that because like Joe said, they're all great teachers. They know, they know how to teach. They know what good instruction looks like. Uh, Does this intervention program cost money? Most of them will if it's any, okay, if it's so then, what we, then what do we do about that money we pay these people? I hate to keep going back to that. So that's, that may be, I don't, I don't think we can go to them right now and say, hey, we don't like this, we want to refund. So we'll have both, we'll be paying for an intervention program. I think Waggle, program. we can have a discussion with, you know, we tried this out for a year with two grade levels. We were very intentional about that. We wanted to see how it worked before we purchased it for everyone. It's not going well. We don't want Waggle, we want to refund on Waggle. We're exploring other options. I think we go into year two, exploring those other intervention options and see if that does form a good balance for instruction where we have our, our core curriculum is the into math and then we have an adopted intervention curriculum and we see how how they play on each other and what that results in if we're still struggling at the end of year two then that is that's when we start making or i start making those phone calls to into math and saying this for the investment that we've made you're not fulfilling it um, if we told them right now we wanted our money back, they would laugh in our faces and said, you've had it for a year. Yeah, but I do think it's important for us to, once this like list of deficiencies is lined out, right. to make them very aware that, you know, that this, this program that it, that has don't see some significant gaps, because they should be able to presumably, like, over time, it's not like they did it, and then they're never going to change it. They should be able to make some sort of an enhancement to their program. And that's so part of my concern from what I'm hearing is some of the, the foundational things, like just the user ability of it, they should have those things ironed out. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't, with an established curriculum producing company, they should not be having these user level errors. If we can't access their program, 
in 2023, that, that is not a good thing. Um, I've worked with current intervention curriculums that one company followed another company and they kind of piecemeal things together. And because of that, there were lots of issues. Mm. This shouldn't be the case. Um, the other concern is hearing that some of the, the anchor charts are just wrong. Some of the math is just wrong. Yeah, it's kind of wrong. That, I mean, <laughs> what, what's the no. peer review process that happens before a product is, is put out? So, yeah, you should like get a calculator and then you can like go do <laughs> sure what right. so maybe we send them a bill and say so this is the amount of time that my staff has spent correcting the identified mistakes yeah exactly yeah. so here's their daily rate here's the time they spent <laughs> but i do agree we start having those conversations about what are the challenges that we you know that we have faced this year and then and start kind of laying back our own work because if we if we're sitting in this position next year and we're considering having that conversation of we want to break our contract, that doesn't need to be the first time that they've heard how dissatisfied we are. Yeah. Um, well, especially if you a company like this is going to be incredibly reliant on schools referrals for this program. Mm -hmm. And obviously it doesn't seem like anybody's really excited about it right now. So I mean from their standpoint, that's like a, that's gotta be a huge well, and that's, that's another kind of... point we throw some of the influence that we have around. And if, if the West Valley teachers as a collective are saying, this isn't a good program, yeah, exactly. then, I, you know, in the Valley, that probably means something now. You get outside and other places and we're, we're just another speck on the map. But um, companies don't like to lose customers. And ultimately, and I this is what I think is so important about understanding these companies. They don't care about student achievement the way that we care about student achievement. We have to look at our kids. We have to look at our families. We have to look at the people that they're going to be whenever they leave us. The people who are developing curriculum, all they care about is how much money they make at the end of the quarter. They are in a money making business. That is their goal. It is, they are not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, which I think makes us a little moistier. I, you know what, Judy, we need to go back to the town. We're really here for the kids. Look at this. You know, I, we changed the program and we expected the quality of the edu math education to go down. I don't remember ever being presented with that. That once you changed it, I mean, we're talking. It's a curriculum, so it's an implementation div, and yeah. that is it's normal with the age and and curriculum in the first year. Seems to me that at the elementary level, you know, when they're teaching one and one equals two, that you should be able to at least maintain not have that <coughs> yet. But we really have the only place to start dip was eighth grade. Well, we often see the dip in the January scores, so it's not unusual yeah. to see them. Cruising along okay in class, and then in January show a dip on an older kids, and it's it's a and then they bounce back up on the spring scores. So and some of that is to the way they lay it out. Like we're teaching different standards at different times, as opposed to go math laid it out differently. Like we'll by the end of the year we'll get through all the same second grade standards, but when we go to the winter benchmark test, we may not have covered time and money within the math. So when they get a question on time and money, they're not going to be able to answer that, and they're going to dip. Whereas with, go, yeah, whereas with goal math, we had already taught time and money and, you know, or vice versa. That was just one yeah. example. So, yeah. And the older they get, the much harder it is to influence that. And the older they get, the much harder they will be to influence because a lot of kids are at the range that they're at. Mm -hmm. And we're still struggling with those oldest kids at eighth grade are probably my most affected by the COVID shutdown. Mm -hmm. So, how the kids act? I just wanted to say the supplement thing here we're talking about. Like, what do you guys use? We like used, you like to use? We used to use Reflex. And that's about three or four thousand dollars, right? Like, I, I don't remember it was two thousand, but that's only so for two. I just wanted to give you guys an idea like it's not that big number. 
Yeah. yeah. The, the yeah. interventions we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> was, so yeah. Give you a little idea of how much that costs. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. And just for some feedback for you guys, because I know you've asked for amount purchases. I've said no to a few purchases pretty much across the board whenever oh. I mean that's been yeah. <laughs> science, ELA. Yeah. No one has been immune um, unless there was some kind of background to to decide otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just been the unfortunate nature of the uncertainty for the, this year. Right. Um, so it's not just about just has it been just math. And you know that if it's two thousand dollars per grade level, and we're looking at purchasing it for five grade levels, K through four, that's ten thousand dollars. And then the science department wants some type of purchased additional curriculum as well. And then social study wants something purchased. So whereas two thousand dollars at a grade level is is not a significant amount, <clears throat> when you start compounding all of the requests. Um, it does become pretty significant. Mm -hmm. I have a, a purchase order on my, on my desk right now for over $1,100 for additional curriculum materials. Mm -hmm. um, so that, it, it adds up. Okay, well, um, we have a lot to think about. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much for coming in and bringing that. That was uh, <coughs> very necessary. And, you know, honest, it's good to hear honest, honesty people coming up and you know, what they think about their program. So thank you for your honesty and for your study of this. Okay. Now, going forward, <laughs> um, Tina, did you want to do a principal's report? Or do we do I lost my notes in all this. I can share um, uh, a little bit. Because, uh, yeah. I'll Carrie, really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We, I don't know what Richard covered. Did you cover everything, Richard? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> we might have covered it all, but we're at the end of the trimester and grading, you know, they're, they've posted the grades, the cards go home this week. Um, I work with a lot of really hardworking people, students and staff. This is a tough time of year to come through, January, February, and March. Um, I read on one of my principal groups, don't make any career decisions in March. <laughs> what is um, Thank you. They're working really hard. It's a, they're in the meat of what happens in the school year. And it, you know, and then to have this long winter. And Anchor the other day slammed his locker and was like, it snowed again. <laughs> and he looked at me because he slammed it really hard when he said it, and he realized I was there, and I know I know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's still snowing, right? and so I'm just proud of everybody that they're they're just plugging along and working really hard. Looking forward to those things that I talked about. That um, just they've got field trips coming up, things to look forward to. The promotion ceremony, the winter dance got moved. It's now a spring dance and social that will be happening um, in April. So we just have a lot going on with Mrs. Thurman. It seems like we collided the the um, registrations for the high school with our own planning and then um, with the end of the trimester and kids picking their courses and things here. So we move that back. And also we'll also, you know, we don't have any outside access right now. And some of these classes are, are pretty um, pretty large. Um, anything else that I'm forgetting right now? I had a list and uh, am I doing okay? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, I just have gotten some questions just so everybody knows there are no cameras in our bathrooms at West Valley Schools. Yes, the kids are asking if there are cameras in the bathrooms. So no cameras in the bathrooms at West Valley Schools. A popular question right now. And student from the student group, um, they're meeting this month from the room reps. Um, just more questions about what there is to do outside for middle schoolers. And um, just something to think about in the future. There, it was the room reps talked quite a bit about that, about what they can do at recess time. And we, we don't have a lot of Paris this year, not a lot of Paris support. So I haven't been able, you know, um, I'm working with lunch detention. So I haven't been able to open up like the game room or other things, you know, even just to give them a break inside. Um, you know, and the classes are running throughout most of the day in the library. So just thinking about that as ideas come up that some of the student concerns are what can they do um, in a pretty short time, but we even think, you know, if we're on this campus forever, like could there ever be some covered areas for playgrounds or, you know, if 
comes up with staff to that. But that was big on their agenda to share with us. Sounds like the same uh, story at home, too. <laughs> what am I going to do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. What do you do now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, for sure. Um, oh, I guess the last thing is that the fifth grade position that had opened up, and Cindy could share on this, but it, it didn't fill like for the certified long term sub. So there's still a guest teacher in the classroom, and I've been there teaching uh, English language arts with her and science and social studies in the late afternoon and setting that up. Um, the students are going out with the other three teachers for math, the other three fifth grade teachers. The, the class is uh, small enough at that time because some students go to special education. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily overload those other three classes. So we've divided them up for math and um, that's working okay. And um, reduced the class size to 20, so it's manageable um, for someone on a substitute time to be able to grade and assess with the students. And um, yeah, let me see these curriculums that you're talking about. I was going to say, if you go to the tier two math too, it has a nice cut and dry. Sometimes I look at that, and um, but definitely see, um, you know, to that end that when when they implemented the core, almost all of the text became um, a reading curriculum. Almost all of them, they're really heavy on the word on the math text from the different companies. Yeah, I remember thinking that as a teacher. Wow, you have to know how to read really well in these areas. So you can see that. Um, but that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Superintendent Okay. Um, so just a couple. Um, so I, this has kind of been my practice. If I only bring what I can fit on a sticky note. Um, when I was a principal and would go to admin meetings, my superintendent would always ask, okay, what's on your sticky note? Because I only ever bring I can fit on a sticky note, um, which is another reason why I do y'all's Friday's emails because it keeps it keeps me to a sticky note and not like expanding to one of those big sticky notes. <laughs> um, so a couple. So let's start with the easy things. Um, are the Yellowstone Boys and Girls Ranch who provides our community mental health um, services? They have asked about using our board this summer. To transport students so they still provide services through the summer um, but i just wanted to get some feedback from the board about exploring a contract with them that would give them that permission it wouldn't just be a yeah y'all take it here's the keys um we have some type of, of contractual agreement um but otherwise <coughs> transportation is a barrier for many of those students and being able to have access and they also try to get the kids out and about and do different things during the summer. Um, so would the board consider at the next meeting um, considering a, a contract just for the summer for the, the Yellowstone boys and girls? Yeah, seems fine to me, yeah. How many kids are we talking about? Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. They'd probably fill it up. Sure. I think it carries there are kids. seven. There are students. Okay. Um, in the past, they were able to use the van that we're, oh. we're we, we haven't gotten rid of it yet, but it's still not a safe vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, and what I had kind of just in discussion talked to them about is basically they're they're going to pay their expenses. Yeah. So insurance um, included. Right. So we'll add we'll include that in whatever contract we work out a percentage of insurance, their their gas. Right. Uh, I don't necessarily want to charge on mileage because I think that that's, that's excessive. They're operating under limited budgets as well, but coming up with something that would be reasonable and appropriate that gives them the resource that they need. So, so. they oh, we'd be giving them is a, is, is a the vehicle, and then what we'd be we'd be out repair and maintenance on it because you know they wear our our well, vehicle out, but they'd be paying insurance and gas and. Oil, whatever. We'd, we'd probably we'd have like a maintenance fee, right. uh, but I, I don't see them going through like a set of tires over the summer. No, are um, they going to they going to be using it every day? That's a great question. I don't know. I can find out. Yeah, I mean if that would seem if they're going to be on the road with it every day, from eight to three or whatever. Right. That's one thing. If they're going to use it occasionally, maybe even two, three times a week, that's a different right, a different scene, I think. And where are they going to be going? Are they going to be taking it down to Polson? Are they going to be taking it I don't up to so. Glacier? 
Or are we talking them just taking it over to everybody? I think they stay pretty local. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I can find out the level of use. And I think I think we really think they need to consider rather than just say, yeah, take it for everyone. Yeah. Um, and that I think I I prefer for things to be in writing, and that'd be part of a contract that we have with them is you know the the level of use, the frequency, kind of a range. You know, you're not going to go any further than how many yeah, miles. how many miles do they expect you to? Well, I hate to be that way. I mean, because you know, like to think, yeah, it, you know, it's great for the kids to go in the right. grade, but mm, it, then we end up with a repair and maintenance bill at the end. That's beyond what we. And yeah, thank you. Just go ahead and make yeah. So we'll work on kind of an idea of what their their mm -hmm. use will be, and just kind of put some things in writing and bring that to the next meeting to review. Okay. And then by the meeting after that, we should have something mm -hmm. agreed to. Um, we got to get it by Maryland. So, yeah. <laughs> <Watch out. laughs> you want somebody um, a car one time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, one of the big topics right now um, at West Valley and across the state is, um, is public educator insurance. Um, it's a conversation that we're having in negotiations. Um, it's a conversation that's being held at the state level. Um, and I'm not going to go into any great detail, but it's a topic I want to introduce because it's going to be reoccurring from now, probably throughout the end of the year. Um, and insurance benefits offered by the school district is something that impacts every single employee one way or another here. Either employees who don't want it have to take it, um, we have employees who are taking it who don't necessarily like it, but they don't have any other options. Um, but I sent out a survey to the entire staff and received 60 responses. So that's probably about 60%. Um, and we will discuss this in greater detail at another time, but it has been good feedback. So some highlights. Um, of, and this is 61 responses. So I don't know how it's at 61 when they're all right, there you go, Google. Um, so I have other options for health insurance coverage. So this would be someone who has maybe through a spouse or Medicaid, Medicare or something else. 39% um, say no. We are their only option for health insurance coverage. Uh, about 61% have, they have other options that they could explore. Um, and then if given the choice, I would. So we have about 17% who said that they would continue with the current provider or basically continue with whatever the district option um, makes available. About 46%, 45.8% said that they would consider staying with a district plan if we had a better one available to them. And about 37% said that they would opt out regardless because probably they have a spouse who got a pretty sweet deal. Um, and then there are just some different questions. What are your greatest needs? Um, feedback about the current plan. Um, what we've done in exploring options is Cecilia and I and um, Mark Fessler represented the Teachers Association met with representatives from Paint West, who is our, they, they cover some of our insurances. They are shopping around the health plan for us and should be getting us that information back this week. We are also, Cecilia and I are meeting with the insurance consortium that we are currently associated with. That's next week, okay, yeah. Um, so we, we are doing what we can at the district level to try to be as competitive as possible. We're approaching this from very much a, a consumer standpoint of, we have a large body of people who pay for insurance. Um, we should be able to shop around and get them the best rates possible whenever it comes to, to health insurance. So that is, is a discussion that's ongoing. Um, I don't know what the legislature is doing. I haven't, I'm a little bit behind on the updates. Uh, there is a bill that is being considered that would establish a trust. Um, we all know that the state has the surplus in funds. This bill would take $60 million of seed money to establish this health trust for public school employees. 
Uh, if last I saw that it was still in committee, it has not been tabled. Um, I emailed every person who voted no on their little first go around. I got one response from someone who said that it is still very much being considered that they were just not fond of the language that was being used. So that may still be a possibility at the state level. Um, no one at the state level has given me an answer as to why teachers can't join the state, the, the public plan that exists. Um, so a representative at OPI let slip in a meeting that she pays $20 a month for health insurance because she's able to join the, uh, the state health insurance plan. Uh, and point of reference for myself and just my kids, my out of pocket after the district's pitches in its portion is still over six hundred dollars to have myself and my kids covered. I don't even cover my husband. It becomes unaffordable. It's already unaffordable. So if I'm at my level looking at my insurance from that standpoint, if you're a brand new teacher or if you're a fairly young teacher with a young family, um, that's the significant concern. Um, the informal response that I've gotten from people is has varied from teachers are unhealthy in general, because there's a lot of us, um, and teachers have babies, because a lot of teachers are females, and the cost of maternity care and increased family sizes is an increased expense on, on that insurance fund. So, um, so anyhow, we will see where that goes. Hopefully, as a district, we're able to, to find something that is more um, competitive. The other concern with the current insurance is, unless you're hospitalized, it's really worthless. Uh, it, it covers really significant catastrophic type things. But for just a day, day I have a cold. Well, you're going to choke some Gatorade and Tylenol and something free, and I'm going to go to the doctor because so much has to be paid out of pocket before the insurance will kick in and the deductibles are pretty high. So insurance is pretty dismal at this point. Uh, I would encourage that whoever you're looking at um, for insurances allow options for employees to choose. And I know it's going to be very hard to get any of them to even consider that. But let them know, fine, we're not going to use you if you don't allow our employees to have options because some people might want a lower priced catastrophe policy because they have other ways of getting certain care. Um, and others would like, no, I want a really comprehensive low deductible policy because I don't want to have to worry about certain things because I have these things going and, on. But and what's currently available, I mean, we have options. We have three plans currently. There's three plans that are made available. Um, they're all terrible. <laughs> yeah. um, I, because my family is pretty healthy, we don't have any kind of long going on, you know, ongoing type things that have to be maintained. Um, we have the high deductible to have the lower premium. Um, but if, if you are someone who has an ongoing health issue, you're, you're diabetic or you have a kid who's asthmatic and goes to the doctor a lot or some type of other just long term ongoing illness, um, insurance is a killer. So, um, and then I also, like I said, I think of it from a retention standpoint or to, to attract teachers for recruitment purposes. Uh, that's something, when I was 22 and I first started teaching, I didn't think anything about insurance because it was just covered by the state. Mississippi has a great program. Um, but here in Montana, not so much. So, so um, deductibles are crazy even on the good ones. Yes. So we are exploring that. Um, so just to to throw it out there, um, so negotiations are going on right now between the district and the teachers association. One of the contracts that has been discussed and that is at kind of my reflecting on. Um, will be removed from the teacher's contract is the technology director. Um, so when originally when school districts had technology directors, they also talked. They maybe were in the classroom for 
75% of the day. And then the last half of the day, they went around and fixed everybody's printer. Um, over time, as, as technology has changed, um, and also here specifically as size has changed, that percentage has started to slide where the, the technology director, instead of it just being part of the person's day, it has become the entirety of the day. Um, there are additional responsibilities that go above and beyond the 7.30 to, to 3.30 timeframe, definitely beyond the scope of a 187 day school year. Um, our technology director also supervises others as who are technology mentors. Um, and whereas the work she does is highly supportive for our students, she doesn't actually work with kids. Um, so I think given just the way contracts are formatted, that it would be more appropriate to offer her a contract that is more in line with an administrative contract than a teacher's contract. Um, so just to throw that out there, that will be on the radar for discussion at a later meeting. Um, we talked last month about services offered by MTFDA. You will notice that they are not an action item on this agenda. Um, we are, so last week, um, I became aware of some additional information of other um, law offices that may provide similar services that we need and may do it at a better price. Uh, my kind of evaluation of what MTSBA offers is that they are very heavily focused in advocating and being involved at the congressional standpoint. Um, and that's, that's great, but is that really what we want to pay for? Um, so Cecilia and I are going to check into some other options. And again, it's a matter of shopping around. Are we getting the best bang for our buck. Um, and we'll hopefully be bringing that to the next board meeting and being able to make a recommendation or at least bring in a couple of options that we look at and decide, okay, let's, let's choose this for our policy maintenance and uh, just cursory everyday legal advice. Um, but we want to be able to make a good choice. <coughs> um, so, <coughs> So the levy, what I am <clears throat> planning to do is later this month, have an ad start advertising after this meeting, so starting tomorrow, a community forum, kind of a round table discussion and advertise it in as many ways and as many formats as possible and bring people in live in West Valley and pay taxes here and have discussions about um, what does our, how far does our current budget get us? So the preliminary numbers were released a couple of weeks ago. We're getting a whopping $15,000 more next year than we did this year. Um, that's not going to go very far. I think um, giving the community as much information as possible. What, what would next year look like if all we had was the base budget? What will next year look like if we have the base budget plus school-wide Title I funding? What would next year look like if we have a base budget, Title I funding, and a potential levy? Um, talking to the community or having the opportunity at least to discuss the things that we didn't buy, those programs the teachers were told no to, uh, hands-on materials the teachers were told no to. The fact that our paras are significantly underpaid when looked at in the greater scope of the job market. Um, bringing in information like Richard presented earlier and showing the real impact of not being financially sound enough to offer competitive wages for both paras and for substitutes. So um, my impression of the community here is that the community appreciates facts and numbers, and this is the reality of, mm -hmm. of what finances and instruction looks like at school. Um, so it, it's not going to be warm and fuzzy. We're not going to have, you know, a circle and a talking stick that we pass around. Um, but I want people to be 
as informed as possible um, and get feedback potentially be really nice form a levy committee out of that community meeting to move that process forward but um <clears throat> I don't want anyone to feel like they didn't have the opportunity to hear what are the financial needs and what are the impacts of, of our deficits uh, on the school. So that is that's that's where I'm at in planning for and thinking about um, running a levy. Um, does the board have any questions, is there anything that you think that would be of value that we would want to be sure to include in, in that type of meeting? Um, we, well, we have it down here in the, in the, um, in the school, whatever assembly room or whatever in the middle, or do you have it in the gym or what do you think? My thinking is the, the, the middle school commons here. Um, as far as a venue, we may end up having more than one meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't mind having an off-campus venue to have this conversation as well. Um, some people won't come because it's in the school. They feel like I, I don't have a kid at the school. I'm not involved in the school, but if we you know, had some other location, I mean, I'm trying to think of one out here. But that's what would it be? Would cider work? Yeah, yeah. cider house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is they pass out ballots <laughs> at the same, yeah. about an hour <laughs> into the forum. Do you like this cider, cider or yeah. this? Here's a three. Yeah. <laughs> You're about, no, here's We can be your server. Here's what? But so that's, we will definitely um, post an event here and have conversations. Um, I want to start putting things out, start collecting feedback. People, you know, if I can get them to email me in advance and start having conversations, um, I want to do that. My thinking is, is that we will run the a levy election. And if the community says no, I don't want us to look back and say that, well, we didn't inform them well enough. We didn't mm -hmm. tell them what was going on. They didn't have an accurate picture. Or for people to be able to say, the school never told us what was going on. Well, we tried, but did you come? What about the reader board? Well, we can use that as well, sure put things that. there. But so Cecilia posts the board meetings yeah. in the newspaper. There's like an events section. Um, contacting the paper to see, you know, can we run an ad? You know, because that I don't know who reads the little events section to see what's coming up. And if people are reading that, you know, what what keywords are they looking for? Um, yeah, or just, uh, I don't know if you could do, like, well, like the reader board or some sort of signage or something that we could do, because, you know, you get a ton of traffic. Or even if, well, I guess, really have the kids make some. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, class, we have like a, at least for elementary, we use class dojo, and I know that would only be teacher or parents. Right. Yeah. I feel like the parent the audience is, I mean, they're very accessible. We can get information yeah, right. to them. Um, I, I want the information to go further than the parents because if, if this were a matter that was just strictly up to vote to the parents, then we'd be, okay. we'd yeah. be I think in it's, pretty um, good shape. Like if we could get an article written for the beacon or the interlake, you need to get to like out of state people who've paid a lot of money in West Valley and they don't have kids here. They, the information on why it matters that your neighbor's kids are well educated, <laughs> how it affects your home values and your community. You know, something like that where, you know, those, those yeah. people are right. reached. And you know, know I think as a general rule, people are moving in are rich and they, um, you know, they, they may have money that they would be willing and they, we don't have really a whole lot of trouble when they do any of these fundraisers for anything. Somebody that has a fire or a sick kid or whatever, mm -hmm. they always come up with lots 
some money to these people. So I'm thinking we need to tap into that resource. Mm -hmm. but, and that, I, I need a really big donor yeah. to say here. What's that? We need a big donor just to say here. There yeah. you go. <laughs> there, and there's probably one of them out there. There's people have these ten million dollar houses. They're looking for places to put their money, right? We'll yeah. write them a tax letter right here. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to do it. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Maybe we could get, I don't have any connections. <coughs> on the internet. What would you, we might have to talk to the internet communication and see what they could come up with. So mm -hmm. You're thinking of doing this after the um, spring break? Before spring break. Spring have, to have an initial meeting before the last spring break. Week in the, this month, right? So we're it's talking immediately. Sorry, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm fine with that. But I mean, we're talking about we're going to get the information up. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, and, and that's not going to be, uh, that won't be the only meeting. That won't be the, the only opportunity. Um, I think we, like Richard said, you know, what he brought tonight was, was pretty, you know, cut and dry. It was just numbers, but taking those numbers and putting them in an infographic form and putting that on our Facebook page, putting that in the newsletter, sending those PDFs and screenshots to the teacher so that they can add them to a class dojo message. Um, I just wanna be able to plaster as much information as possible in a very accessible way um, so that people understand. I, in, in my thinking and my reflection on the, the public opinion, not necessarily here, but nationally around education is that we all got flooded with ESSER money, so we're all loaded, um, and that uh, schools just, that, that the state gives it to us, and that it's an obligation of the state. Well, the state technically is meeting their minimal obligation to us. As a community, what what do we want that is more? And that the more part is what the community will decide. Do they, does the community want to come back? And I like, I, I like the idea of kind of going at it a couple of different ways too, just to show obviously like this, this apparent need, like with what Richard has shown, um, you know, that specific need, then the number of pairs that we had in previous years versus now um, to say, hey, this isn't just, us on a hiring spree here. We're just, right. we are not able to afford the correct amount of staffing because of our budget constraints. And then also kind of layered into not just saying we need, we need, we need, but make sure that we show, um, you know, the standards performance that show how excellent of a school, you know, hey, you guys are providing your money and it's working really well. We want to continue to have it work really well. And, uh, you know, and, and, we're not and this is wasteful. what we need to kind of, to make that happen yeah and, and going through the budget as well and um, every yeah. attempt is made to be as efficient and as meaningful as possible um I, and that from the beginning of, of my coming here i knew we were going to get to this point one way or the other and that i will have to ultimately stand in front of people and them ask you know well, well where could you save another dollar I don't know. Uh, and I'm very much anyone who is asked to look at expenditures or anything related to our budget. I've laid it out because I realize I am not the smartest person. Um, and if someone else can look at it and go, hey, look, there you go. Do that and this. And a lot of it, you got an extra 10 grand. Um, there, are, there are people who know more than I do who have the potential to find solutions. And the more involved people are and the more knowledgeable they are, the greater the likelihood that they will help us find a solution. The solution may not be a levy, but unless we bring, you know, we have to bring people together and have a conversation to get to the point of maintaining the level of instruction and staffing that West Valley is known for. Um, at this point, it's, it's, it's financial and we need other solutions. So that's that's where we're coming at this from is how do we solve this this burden? Because 
not buying extra math for everybody <laughs> that that didn't cut it we're, we're still we're still struggling uh, and i would like to be able to tell teachers yes if you feel like this is going to make a meaningful impact then we need to be able to provide it to our students i'd like to we'll give our parents more money like to me that's the that's the biggest yeah. that that to me is it Biggest thing we need to push with people, you know, they make $17 at McDonald's and, and we pay them less. I mean, that's a good point, Marilyn. I mean, I, I think know, that's the whole thing. Full disclosure, essence. I don't know how you can just disclose the. Yeah, I think it's all on public oh, record. Exactly. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Our an entry record. level para is making less than $13 an hour here. Yeah, right. Yeah, they with, with McDonald's with hooker, which is 17. Yeah. And they get free online medical there and tuition paid and hair <laughs> free. Since we're on that topic, our our lowest paid para, if they opt out of insurance, let's say they have insurance through another person, they are able to take the six thousand dollars that the district puts towards benefits. They're able to take that as like a cash distributed over theirs. It just as a reference, it brings them up from like eighteen thousand dollars a year to twenty four thousand dollars a year. So a para who's not taking any benefits is, is taking all the cash that she can is still clearing $24,000 a year. And how many hours would that be for? That's seven and a quarter hours for 180 days. So before moving to the action, I don't. So last month we, in a closed session, discussed my evaluation. Um, I know we're already running late, but this is going to be a process over the next couple of months. I would like to request an executive session to discuss my contract. Um, I brought lots of printouts and stuff, so hopefully it can go quickly. Um, but I, um, but I know people are here to listen to the action items, and I'd like them to have that opportunity. So if we could have the executive session after um, after the action items. Yeah, I think anybody has an objection to that. I think we'll do the action items and then uh, we'll have an executive session. Cindy, if we, okay. All right, with that, should we go on to the action items? Um, consideration of the proposed 23-24 school calendars. And they were on our, um, they are on this. I have copies of them here though. Um, I guess myself, I feel that the, um, what was it? We did, Cindy set out, set out surveys and 52% would like the late start to 47% wanting early release, really, really close. But I, I feel that uh, with the parents even was, you know, was even um, more of a discrepancy than, than the 52 to 47. And I'd like to have them think that we'll follow what the survey indicated and go with the, the um, late start like we're doing now. I don't know how everybody else knows, but I'd like to see us go with the late start. I think there's a good advantages to both and disadvantages, but, and it's an awful close, at least this, with you did the significant digits or whatever it would be really close but i i'd like to see us maybe stay with the late start but we can entertain conversation on that yeah i agree i think it's, it's obviously it's really close but it's, it doesn't tell us that we're doing something completely against everyone's wishes no you're going to have you know you're going to have half the people mad at this either way <laughs> pretty much 50 50. so not. How What's impossible, that? or how many years out would it be to ascertain the idea of a four-day school week? I don't just think table I, this for today, yes. and we can look at that and move, yes. at least as an option. I'm just saying. Yeah, I don't think it's. I mean, it's not going to happen next year. Why not? Well, <laughs> okay, but we have to adopt the calendar with the idea that if it doesn't, then we have to have something in place, right? Or do we have to? Does this have to be casting? Just change the late start to no start. 
<laughs> we adopt a calendar and publish it. Are we bound to it? Yeah. To yeah. This day? Or you're you're pretty committed. And uh, what is our date that we have to have this figured out? Said it was this month. It's March. Yeah. Most we're talking this month. Yeah. We're we're already uh, running a little bit behind on having a calendar approved. And I I'm not opposed to a four day work week a four day school week, but I don't know enough about that to say one way or the other, which one I would endorse. And whenever you're, we're talking about so many variables associated with that, we're talking about the impact on families, whereas now they're dependent on their children being in school five days a week, and then we're gonna to switch to four next year. I don't think that's a good consideration. Um, I don't know what the impact on student achievement is. I don't know how, I, I haven't read any research, and unfortunately, I missed Ashley's spill at the beginning, so I don't even know what that was. <laughs> so, uh, well, I, so, I guess the question is, is how much time do we have to actually make this decision? Because if we have two or three months to actually make this decision, mm -hmm. let's spend the time and research this yeah. and make the right decision for our calendar versus, uh, I mean, maybe it's going to take a year or two to actually research this and come up with an answer, then yes, we need to. Something I think switching to a a four day calendar this school year for next year, I would not recommend it. Um, would I recommend researching and spending uh, some time finding out how other districts have done this, how it's been implemented? And I heard on the radio last week they did this big study in the UK and everybody loved it and stuck with it. But that was in an industrial setting, not in a school setting. Um, I, that it is a significant change, and I, I am slow to move on to these significant changes like that. That's just my recommendation. Um, some people are, are quicker, but I would I would want to know more before I would stand here. And, and make that recommendation. Yeah. I think uh, we need a lot of community. We need to know a lot more too, one. but I, yeah. just I do, if I we do. had months and months to actually make this decision on the calendar, then we could use it to at least know a little bit more first. But yeah. I think, well, if we don't have Maryland that time, we have to do the calendar. I think we've got, to, we've got to have it in, don't we, Cindy? We can't. That, I, I don't, I, I don't know, because I wasn't expecting this whole four day. No, no, but I mean, we have to, I thought you said before that, you know, we were a little late in okay with calendar for next year anyway because it's about to be i don't know that there's a hard steadfast oh, deadline it's emails in the county asking for our calendars like once all the reports are proven you know they need a copy of it so i don't know what that means like, yeah sorry, yeah, sorry. I, just, um, I think another thing to consider is that um if it might have to go through the union. It really affects teacher contracts and number of days. It would affect the pay scale. It would affect. It would affect working conditions. So yeah, there's like five things that you have to go through that the state says you have to go through before you can make that switch. It's not that it's impossible, but yeah. they have, they recommend these surveys with community, find out the impact, do yeah. impact statements. You got to check with your union. There's like it's not an impossible thing, but I think you are probably looking out. I think there is a policy that tells us what the date is that we have to have the calendar done by. If it's not your CBA, then I think it's a policy. My brain was thinking this was going to be a year or two process to even look at it. So, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I just wanted to. Yeah. But I know it's out there. Talk about it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that is, is certainly something that we can pursue mm -hmm. going through those steps. I would prefer to do it next year. Um, well, we should we should start pursuing it now. Yes. Yeah. Right. We can start right. now, but it's but but with the idea that next year is already set up with a, a calendar in place, and we're going to pursue this four year, that four days of the year after. Okay. So we need a, we need a motion. I'll make a motion to address Which one? <laughs> we got to either do that. Uh, so Thirty release or the late start. Yeah. So late start is option A. Early release is option B. Uh, I'll make a motion. 
for August 8th. Okay. okay. I'll Let, second. Uh, any, any discussion? A is late start, right? A yeah. is late start. Yeah, I'll second. Wednesday late start, correct? As it is now, Wednesday late start. Right. Friday. Right. Wednesday, is it Friday, Friday or Wednesday late start? Friday. Friday late start. Okay, Friday late start. Okay, Friday late start. That's that's option A. All right. Any discussion? Yeah, if you are you going to take comment? Yes, this is the comment can, section. Can I share comment? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So um, some of this is my own uh, thoughts on this, and some of this came from other staff members. So just some some uh, I thought, why am I advocating for the late start still, and I will support whatever gets decided. But the late start, um, a few things regarding staff. Um, on well, for some people, it might not be the teachers, but on Fridays there is additional time to remove snow before the crowds get here, and the roads are better for the buses. On the late start Fridays in the winter, it is lighter out for travel and at the bus stops. Um, on the late start, the staff is fresh for meetings, and they're not tired from teaching all day. Meetings then are about the topic at hand and not about the problem of the day. Um, student interruptions are rare on the late start in those meetings in the morning. Staff members attend and they don't tend to set appointments at that time. And I know that when we had early releases, it was pretty common for them to take time off on that day or the afternoon because then they have less sub plans. On a late start, the start time is true for the meetings for the PLCs. Um, they're clean starting at 8 a.m. If we release 45 minutes early, it takes at least 10 to 15 minutes to clear this end of the building of students and the middle school teachers monitor the halls at the end of the day and the meeting time starts getting fuzzy. Um, for me as an administrator at the beginning of the day, I'm more able to meet with staff and sit in on the meetings and address any concerns or questions the teachers have about data and curriculum. With an early release, my support as an administrator uh, to that group would decrease because at the end of the day, I'm usually tending to student and family concerns and then the operations of the building and buses, etc. Afternoon PLCs would put an additional strain on after afternoon meeting times when we have special education and parent meetings, and I usually have those one out of every three days. Um, impact on the 5-8 students. Um, students may come to late. Oh, this is for both. Students may come to school at the normal time uh, in the morning because there's parents here to watch them. And that would be true even if they stayed late. There could be more in the afternoon because we have athletics. It could be up to 50 at a time waiting here. But um, they have students have support on either end. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that middle schools aim for a start time no earlier than 8.30. And one day a week, our students benefit from the opportunity to sleep for an extra 30 minutes to an hour. Studies show that adequate sleep affects mental health, academics, and school performance. On early release day, students act like it's a holiday. Some of the academic tone gets lost and it's replaced by an air of playtime. The kids are not settled on those days and even free times are hard to manage. This doesn't happen with the late starts and if anything, the students are better on those days. The proposed early release is planned for Wednesday because we know from history that in early release days, uh, more students are absent when we have an early release. So, and this will be compounded by a Friday or Monday early release. So we don't set the early release on Friday or Monday, more kids will be absent. So a Wednesday late start would cause the middle schoolers to have an early release or a weekend after every two school days, in addition to rotating A and B schedules. So with reduced staff, the students have an, an A day and a B day and those classes alternate. So they would be going A day, B day, Monday, and then a different schedule for Wednesday, and then an A day or B day, A day, and then you have a weekend, and then two days again, and then they, you know, it's never consistent. And even though they still have A days and B days, the Friday late start allows for middle school students to have the same time schedule and continuity four days in a row, and then an abbreviated Friday. Four consecutive days allows the students to settle in. I don't know the entire elementary perspective, but they don't, they run the same schedule on all five days currently. I know that they need uh, some help with parents and things to be able to get all those um, interventions and things in. It's tight for them, but it would uh, really cause the middle school to be inconsistent. And parents have shared that they would rather students have increased <coughs> unstructured alone time in the morning when the parents already know the students are at home and leaving from there to school rather than unstructured time in the afternoon when they're coming home to empty houses. And then another comment just from parents is they like no rush Fridays. It's a more relaxed start at the end of a busy week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right. Do we have any more discussion? Or are we ready to take a vote on option A, Friday to start? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. All right, recorded that that's majority. So it looks like we're going to have Friday to start. Okay. Consideration about a death to make a tenant's agreement. Cecilia. Yes, so we have uh, one student that transferred to Crossroads in late January. So we just got the agreement um, from Crossroads to go ahead and go there. So we just need to okay it. Yeah. So somebody want to make a motion to send our, this student uh, out of district for Crossroads? Uh, make a motion for the student to go to Crossroads. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Consideration of accepting the retirement of Medicaid over. No. It is. Yes. Beautiful yes. letter. Beautiful letter. It brought tears to my eyes. I thought it was. Thank you. Well, I have a gorgeous um, letter. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for your comments. Um, I was just thinking this is a long, kind of depressing meeting on the level. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, as one of the, you know, higher end teachers, as far as the pay scale goes, <laughs> half my salary is getting. Raise the para okay. and then have to hire a new teacher. That would yes. be very happy. <laughs> so if I could leave that with you, I'll do that. Yes. If I have any say where that money goes. <laughs> Otherwise, um, I, I love West Valley. I love you. Yeah. I love yeah. my time here. But Thank you. Yeah. Time yeah. Yeah. Although we should have done this before the calendar vote and then asked her if there was one of them that would have kept her here longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, thank, thank you. Thank you. I love your kids. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. We'll entertain a motion to accept Medicaid retirement. I'll, I'll make a motion. <laughs> 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 well, She's had a couple of them. All right. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, the first consideration, first reading on board policy, that cell phone policy that we talked about last um, meeting. Does everybody have that plan here? Yeah. I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, and, but in discussion on that, to, to, to check it out. Yeah, we're going to let people have option of using their own phone and having them type in for that or not. It, yeah, so I think it's so. This is just the first reading, so we have to accept the first reading. And the next next meeting is when we would put it into the. All right, this is first not done. I Correct. think we have to do it. I think we have to okay it on the first reading, and then we. Then we put it into the group on the second reading that is correct. next month. So with this, we're just going to consider that first reading of the board policy 6430 about cell phones. And I tried looking at other districts because mm -hmm. well, I don't specifically know how to change the wording. Um, and I looked at several. Um, Especially some of the larger local districts, they don't have a, a policy 6430. Oh. Um, and there wasn't a model policy on MTSBA. Oh. So, well, I did the best I could thinking about just. What, what did you do? Everybody else read the policy? Mm -hmm. I did. So, there's not a I kind of a, a benchmark to compare things to. Oh. Um, my thinking is that. Other districts probably don't have a policy for this. They just include it in administrative contracts. So it's part of the administrator's contract and not part of district policy. Oh, um, okay. And I think that's probably accurate because I sent an email to other clerks in the district and a lot of them said, uh, some of them said like only the superintendent gets it. Some of them said, you know, principals get it. Some of them, a handful of them get it, but they didn't make it sound like 
Mm -hmm. I would guess that most of them are contractual based. Right. And we, I mean, that's that's another thing to consider. Do we want to, I don't know how we eliminate a policy. Do we, do we need this policy? Um, or is it a, is it a contract decision? I don't want to have to go back and change everybody's contract just because of this. Well, it would be effective next year if we were to contract on an annual basis. Yeah. What's the status quo as far as? Do you mean who has? As far as the, or the, the contribution on a monthly basis. So currently, we don't have anyone on the district plan. Mm -hmm. Laura was the last employee on the district plan. The Her, her data plan was $49 and some change. So that's how we arrived at the, the $50. Um, prior to her, Mark Wilson was on the plan. Uh, well, and I, so when I started, I didn't know that that was an option for me. And so Cindy Foley was in, she's like, oh, well, like something about your cell phone plan. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I think in the years past, there was quite a few people on it, but as they've started leaving, it's dropped off. And nobody and nobody has done the stipend thing before, right? No, that's yeah, actually what most districts do. Yeah, most um, districts do because nobody wants. I mean, I shouldn't say nobody. Most people don't want to. Like, if I have AT and T, I don't want to have to switch to Verizon just to get my cell phone paid for at school. Like, I'd rather so just. It's, it's a matter of either switching providers or having a second phone. Mm -hmm. um, I've had. I've been a, a two phone <coughs> administrator, and it doesn't. Work, it doesn't work for me. It ends up dead in the bottom of my purse, and everybody has my personal number anyhow. Um, and so this time last year, I was looking for a new administrative position, and just about every one that I looked at had a stipend or a cell phone. Um, yeah. It's just, it's more efficient. You're also putting the, the liability of the phone on the employee and not on the district. Yeah. Um, I think we should just do it. In, I feel in like it's less of a policy, but it's yeah. more of a contractual yeah. thing. I, I feel like it was in our there. contracts with no amounts. I feel like for a long time it was in our principal contracts with no amount and option. Yeah, it feels better in a contract, and it feels better that we can look at it. That, I think. That way. I think when this was originally brought forward in 2015, and it was a matter of, of employees being on a district plan, it made more sense to have a policy because you're you're accepting basically something that's district owned and therefore you have a different level of responsibility to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think with no one doing that anymore, um, having a stipend and it's like everything else in a contract that's renewed annually. Right now, the, the going appropriate rate is $50 a month. Um, that would be something we would review every year and if the cost of data plans rises significantly that we would discuss that cost in the contract. That's and what I get. Increase I, like it. It. I like it that way. And that seemed pretty standard yeah. across all the other districts as well. Okay. And that there's no current policy has um, a $100 cell phone allowance towards the purchase of a phone. We would eliminate that because there's no need your people are using their, their personal phones. Um, and also being part of a contract, whenever you bring that contract to the school board, that you would have that approval over who, who the employees are. And it's more about their position and less about who the employee is um, in approving that stipend or not approving it. Right. Um, so it'll be easier so to track what the Jerry wants to We add cap to the, we add cap to the, and it's classified staff instead of the teaching staff. Her contract will be sure to include that because she's our. So just to kind of cap who would recap who would I think would be appropriate for yeah. the stipend. Um, so these are people who are expected to be available by phone pretty much 24 7 one way or another. So there's myself and the two principals. Um, Phil as the facilities manager. He's also the first guy on the alarm list. Um, anything goes wrong in the building, Phil gets a phone call. Cat um, as the technology director, because there are times that it's just quickest to call her. She is also one of those emergency contacts for things that happen in the building. Um, and then the athletic director, just because with teams traveling and she being the point of contact for all of 
our athletic ongoing. Uh, so we, oh, and Cecilia Lucas, she's also on call 24 seven, whether she likes it or not. Okay. <laughs> Even when I'm homesick, I try to send emails <laughs> and then I'm like, I didn't think Sense. <laughs> so she's on vacation <laughs> last week, sending me screenshots of the preliminary budget. <laughs> well, I woke up and it was Friday morning, and I was like, "Oh, it's going to be a football." Mm -hmm. So I had to. I didn't respond. No, I think that all sounds good. I mean, those all seem appropriate, and I think just putting it in the contracts. So as as better. job requirements and working conditions change, if if we more people, it would be appropriate if um if it changes to where it's not appropriate for. Exactly. You know, um, then, then I think it would be easier to modify within a contract than within policy. I agree. Okay. So what we're going to do? We're going to uh, uh, we're going to um, eliminate board policy six to four thirty. I mean, we have to hold on. What or we're going to do? We do. Have, or do we this is wait the first until three the end of the year. This. No. Well, right now, honestly, it doesn't matter because the district isn't paying. Nobody's, nobody's doing anything. No, no one's doing anything. Yeah. But we should get this off the books if it's not. That we so we, well, so that's what I'm saying. We could, well, you can remove it. Remove, remove it, it right it. now because right. it's not going to impact anyone. Well, if we still had people on the district plan and the district is you chose to remove it, yeah. but since no one's on the plan. I'd, I'd like to see us remove the district. Okay. Yeah. This, this board policy number 6430. I'll make a motion to remove this policy. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, any more discussion? All right. Anybody? Everybody in favor of that? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. So that has been eliminated. And it will resurface in contracts, which I think is a good place for it. Yeah. And it's, it's already in my contract. It's, <laughs> it's redundant. Okay. We got that. Yeah. I like it. Okay, next one. Uh, consideration of adding Lisa Bell to Glacier and Three Rivers Bank account and removing Laura Cox. That's a no brainer. But yep. yeah, I just need her to be able to sign and access accounts for payroll. Look, Laura Cox is the, yeah, removed. Yes. So, yeah, so we're, we're at least Bell's the new hiree and we'll just put her in on that. Yep. I'll make a motion. I'll second that. Okay, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, consideration um, of adopting resolution as to any changes in revenues and that's all. So, this is by statute and estimation of because we have no way, shape, or form of knowing what our tax levies will be until August. Okay. Um, so, this is an estimate based on what we did last year compared to what we're projecting. Okay. Um, and so these are the differences in those funds. So using the 15,000 <laughs> extra. Um, so as you can see, most of the funds are actually, I mean, lower by, I mean, a small portion. Transportation fund, I increased, but it's a, projection it's a guesstimate mm -hmm. um but i always feel safe safer adding too much because then come august if we have to you know if it's lower it's better mm -hmm. um so that's just and it has to be run in the paper in the month of march it has to be advertised and so that's what we've got i see that's some of the others are starting to rip by one who landed in the paper yesterday that you know they're so, living in so you would take care of that. And your tuition projection going down is because we're projecting less. So, so tuition, so tuition is for um, Crossroads mm -hmm. and the special ed co-op. Um, and so based on what our um, reappropriated reserves were last year and keeping it similar to okay. gotcha. like as far as like that total amount. Yeah. yeah. So that's why it, it gotcha. just mm -hmm. that much less this year. have a motion to accept that adopt that resolution i'll make a motion to approve the proposed changes okay um, all right any discussion okay all those in favor aye. 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 opposed yes. our acceleration of cross-country coaches 
um, Tony Smith, Board of Aid head coach, I know they have all gone through the process that we have for hiring. I didn't bring my packets with me. Uh, so these are internal. Yep, I oh. opened it up internally with three positions and I have four people interested and then one dropped out said actually would work. And actually they're like, Perfect people that would be doing this. So I'm very happy yeah. with these coaches. Okay. Can we just go ahead and do them all at once? Do we have to go through them? Yeah. Do them all at once. Yeah, let's do them all at once. <laughs> okay. I'll make a motion to approve all the coaches. Oh, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve all, all second cross country. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Any, any discussion? I hope it was in favor. Aye. Uh, all those opposed. Okay, so we go on to next information items, budget expenditure line item detail, which we have in our packet. I've got it. Because I see a little bit. I actually have okay. Okay. Um, and then but these are information items. We don't need to have any. Discussion on the, I will, we can have discussion, but we don't need to vote on them. Okay, there any discussion? No, <laughs> since it's 8.30 at night. <laughs> <laughs> that clock is wrong. <laughs> lane, lane changes, uh, we also have that uh, here. It, 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 it's for information only. So those main changes, which is according to their contracts. So that's sort of the done deal too. Okay, now do we go into executive Thank you. Thank you. We have to make a motion. Yes, this one, right? yeah. Thank you. I'll second your motion. Okay. All right. Any discussion about our name to executive session? Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for Thanks for Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We got a lot of information. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Um, who wants to take notes? Can I? Not at this time. Just say hi. I'm going to take a break.